In this video, I'll show you step by step how to go from this to this in the shortest possible time. This guide's so easy, even grandma could learn to dominate in Manor Lords. Let's get started. If you're interested in following the steps with text as well, I've created a Notion checklist for all to use for free. Link is in the description. So we'll start with a new game. We're going to skip the customization part. You do that as you please. And as far as the game setup, I highly recommend starting with restoring the piece on default mode. It has some challenge, but with the build that I'm going to show you and all the instructions, you should be able to breeze right through it and actually have some fun. If you only like doing the city building stuff, you could do Rise to Prosperity, and that basically turns off all the combatants. But if you have any, even like a slight interest in doing, seeing what combat's like, I recommend doing Restoring the Peace because most of the combat is very simple. The only time you're going to fight a tough battle is when you're the one initiating it, so you have a lot of time. You just have to deal with a small band of raiders once in a while. But again, if you follow the build that I'm showing you here, within an hour or so, you should have an army strong enough to take them on. So I would probably recommend starting here. So the very first thing we're going to do is zoom all the way out and look at the whole map. So there's eight different provinces. There's a three, three, and then two here on the bottom. We own one province. The enemy duke owns two, although the AI is not really turned on yet. They don't build cities, but that will be coming soon. So like I said before, it's pretty relaxed. You don't have to worry about getting attacked by the duke or anything. You do have to worry about bandits and raiders, but they're very easy to deal with as long as you get a little bit of an army set up, which we're going to do very quickly. One thing we're going to want to do is analyze what our territory is going to look like. So every map is going to look like this every time you load up, except for the placement of these resources. So Wald Valdebrand and Ruth and all that, these are all going to be located in the same. The snaking of the roads are going to be the same, but these are all RNG. So like the hunt, the berries, the stone, the iron, and the clay are all going to be thrown randomly throughout the map. And you're also going to notice these things right here. It has like a little crown on top. It says it's a rich deposit. So every province or every region has two rich deposits, or it has one rich deposit and rich fertile soil. Basically, anything that's a rich deposit means it gets more resources than if it was not. So you can see the difference right here. Wild animals with a rich deposit has 40 possible, and then the regular one has only 20. The berries have 128, the non-rich is 64, so it's basically double what it would normally be. It's actually significantly more if you look at some of the other resources, like the stone here is 1,040, but a regular stone only has 140, so it's 10 times more. The other thing we need to be aware of is we want to make sure we're close enough to some of these food resources to make it somewhat practical to use. If you get a bad start, like let me try and find one. So let's take this province for example. If we spawned here at Nesloja, let's say our starting position was right here, we'd be pretty far from the berries. That'd be kind of tough. When you're starting out, you really want to have two sources of food, the hunt, so you can get meat and then the other one for berries, you want to be somewhere in between these. In this case, we're kind of far from our hunt as well. So we could just re-roll it. This game loads really fast. So you could just escape, main menu, and then again, new game, click through it. And then you'll be back in like three or four seconds, start to finish. So again, we're going to zoom out and see. So we started on Zvayao. This one has meat and berries. Again, not too far, actually. This time is fine. The other one would have been fine too. But if you get a bad setup, just restart. Believe me, the, the very beginning of your town is going to be the hardest part. So I would spend a little bit of time getting a decent start. Now this place has a rich deposit of wild animals and also clay deposit. So this would be a decent place to start. When you're first beginning, it really doesn't matter what you get. You can make, even if this had no rich deposits, you could still make a good run of it. So I'll, we'll show you how to do that. So the very first thing you're going to do, you start off with a homeless people's tent with five families, and they're not quite full families. If you look right here, up at the top, you're gonna to see all kinds of stats. That's gonna tell you what kind of resources you have or your labor distribution. So right now we don't have any jobs assigned, so we have five unassigned families, zero assigned. This is how much living space we have, what our total population is. So every family can have up to three people. In the very beginning, you only have two per family because of the tent that we're in, but once we get that sorted, we're actually gonna have three. And then there's some other things. A lot of this won't make a whole lot of sense now, but it'll make sense as we go. I'll explain it. This is probably the most important thing to keep an eye on here is the number of months before supplies run out. This is basically saying if you did nothing, if you stopped all of your production right now, how much food would you have before everybody started to starve? So right now we have four months to get our button gear. It's plenty of time. So 
we'll go ahead and get that fixed. But first, we need to get some of our infrastructure set up. The other side, this side shows all your resources. So construction resources like your timber, your stone, things like that, your food, your fuel, and so on and so forth. Like I said, I'm not going to spend too much time here because we will go over that as we unlock things. I don't want to flood you with too much information all at once. We'll kind of talk about it as it becomes relevant. So very first thing is to put down a road. This is going to be personal preference here. Some people like to make curvy roads and make things look pretty. I'm personally more fan of the jaggedy stuff just because it's easier to put stuff down. But you could, if you really wanted to, you could make nice curved roads. And there's a couple ways to bend it. You could bend it manually just by, you can see right here, you, you left click to start the road. You drag it out and you left click again to put another point. And then you can continue putting points as much as you want. And then if you right click, it'll undo them all. And then very important, if you want to bend them specifically, you can hold control and then mouse wheel. And you see how it changes the curvature. So you can go anywhere from one point to two points or somewhere in between where it's a nice smooth curve. So like I said, me personally, I'm going to keep it simple. Let's just do a straight road American style. Now, the very first thing you want to do is drop down a granary and you want to put a storehouse. Now we're going to put them very close to our starting stuff. So right here, we get a homeless tent with the five families. We get a hitching post with an ox. This guy's going to drag around all of our heavy stuff, the logs, the timber. And then we get a pile of supplies. We need to get these supplies off the ground and into our storehouse. Because if not, and it starts to rain, this stuff is all going to disintegrate. And then we'll lose all of our starting supplies. And then we'll really be in trouble because we won't have any food to, to rely on. So I'm going to speed this up as fast as we can on certain parts. Because we're literally just waiting for them to build. And then as things start to happen, I'll slow it down so that we're not getting inundated. So the granary is finally done. By putting the building down, anybody that's unassigned will automatically go over and start building. So you all, if you have something to build, you always want to make sure you have some family members to build uh, available and unassigned. So the granary is done. We can assign some people here. They will not automatically pick stuff up and put it in the granary if they're not assigned to the granary. So we're going to go ahead and put three people here. That means three families. Again, it's not three people. It's three families that are going to help. So if I look here, if I click on people, this little tab right here, this general is going to show you where you can assign people if you want to add people or, or subtract them. Obviously, we want to have a bunch of people here collecting things, and then you have a, a limit how much you can store in this. It's out of 500. So we want to get the supplies off the floor. And if we click on the t people tab, we can see exactly what they're doing. These people are transporting. One person is gathering and one person is waiting. And I suspect they'll probably turn into transporting very soon. Yep, there they go. So they're transporting. And it's really cool. They show you a line of where they are and what they're doing. So you can, if you're ever not sure what's going on with a building, just do this. Put it on people, sit back and watch for a minute or two, and just kind of see what's going on. You could really learn, learn a lot about the game by doing that. Now, I'm going to switch it back to general and then also pause because here our storehouse just finished and we have two unassigned people that we can throw in there. They will now gather the non-food items. So all of your food items go in the granary. All of your non-food items go in the storehouse. Everything except for timber, which these things are too big to fit in storage, so they just kind of sit around. So let's speed this up until all, all of our supplies are off the ground. Now, we actually have a limited amount of food. It's only 20 food. The rest of the stuff is non-food. So what I'm going to do is take everybody out of the storehouse so they can go back to being builders. In the meantime, these guys are going to pick up all this stuff and throw it in there, but we don't want to have any idle people because we want to, we're at the very beginning. It's very important to be efficient here. So we're going to set up three different buildings. We're going to zoom out and put down a logging camp. The logging camp is used to pick up these right here, these logs. These are basically the primary building blocks of all your buildings. You notice most everything requires timber. The hunting camp is free, but everything else costs timber. So we want to make sure we get plenty of that. We also need to get our people out of being homeless, which is going to cost quite a bit of timber as well. So that's the first thing we're going to build is a logging camp. Now we need to put it near some trees. Problem if we put it near our hunting camp, the problem here is they will deforest this and it'll cause these animals to run away. We don't want them to run away because they're in a really good spot right now. They're basically easy for us to hunt. So what I'm going to do is we could slide it down here and pick anything over here. We could even put it further back here if we wanted to deforest this area. It doesn't really matter where you put it as long as you're kind of close to your supplies and you're near trees. Again, I'm, I'm going to avoid putting it near here just because we don't want to scare the animals away. So I'm thinking probably makes the most sense to put it over here just because there's a lot of trees 
on this back side we have basically 180 degrees for the trees over here it's just a small patch we'll, we'll go through that pretty quickly so that's the first building the next is the hunt so we're pretty lucky right here the hunt is very close to our starting location we can put this down without scaring the animals away if it's a little further away from you like let's say for example if this was the hunt you would still want to put it somewhat close to your granary because that's where the the supplies are going to end up being taken back so you can put it maybe somewhere in between something like this would be acceptable um, i'm going to put the forger hut the other building we're going to do so we did first we did a logging camp next we did a hunting camp and finally we're going to do a forager hut these are all for wood and these two are for food so we need to secure our food and everything else so let's go ahead and put this somewhere back here it's going to be fairly close to the berries and it's also not too far from the granary so everything's set we have three people able to work now what's going to happen when you build buildings it's a little different these people don't just immediately go and start building it unless well this one's a different story because this one has no construction costs it's free but these buildings you'll notice that it has a timber requirement so you need two timber now, these people are too small to carry a timber by themselves. This thing probably weighs two or three times what they weigh. So what they need to do is they actually need to employ the ox. One of the families that is free and available is going to use the ox. Actually, I think we can see it. He's going to grab these timber and supply all these buildings. He'll keep dragging them back and forth until everything's done. Because like I said, he's available. And so he, he's able to use the ox and help with the construction. So here he goes. He's going to go grab one. He's going to carry it over there. Now, you'll notice every building requires timber and if you have only one ox it does slow your progress down a bit so you can build more which we will do eventually just not yet we'll keep it simple so we got one out of two they can partially build the building they cannot build the full structure though so what they'll do is they're going to get the foundation ready and they'll start laying down the initials the initial part you can see they start building and then they stop about halfway so the other timbers there we got people that are going to come back and finish building it the other thing our storehouse is completely full. There's not, well, not completely full, but all the supplies are off the floor, so there's nothing else for them to do. And again, you could check that by looking at the people tab. They're waiting, which means they have nothing to do. So let's pull them off. They will continue to help build structures with the other three families now. So let's speed this up till we get everything done. And anything that pops up, just end conversation. Just skip it. It's it's all placeholders right now. You can pretty much just ignore it. Here we go. So they're here to, sh to finish the building. Now it's ready. We're going to put more people. Now, if you're a fan of hotkeys, instead of clicking it manually, Q and E are the ones that help you assign or unassign somebody. So I'm a big fan of hotkeys. It speeds up the gameplay once you kind of get used to it and comfortable. But uh, we want to put three people in the logging camp because we basically have no timber now. We need to get our timber back. So we're going to put three people on it. The other two are going to help finish building. Now, we actually do have a building done already, which is the hunting camp. Let's put somebody on it and they're going to start gathering animals they'll start hunting bringing them back now the hunting camp we're going to get two things we're going to get meat and we're going to get hides so we're going to get two resources that we desperately need and then this forager hut we're going to put one person on there we don't have any buildings being built currently because we need to wait until we have enough timber to do so so i'm actually going to just put this person on the forager hut just for temporarily as we get more wood we will start to slowly build out our houses so that our people aren't homeless that's going to be the next step the other thing I forgot to mention is this ox needs to be shared among multiple buildings. So the logging camp needs it. Anybody building a new building needs it. And then there's other buildings in the future that we'll build that will use it as well. So this ox can really be a bottleneck. It's just something that you need to be aware of. Right now, it's not that important because we don't really have a town. But it is something that can slow you down. So like I said, they're, they're going to transport all... They're going to walk around, grab these, these logs, and bring them back. Always remember, anything that has to do with logs, you have to have an ox. So I'm going to speed this up until we start to collect some timber. We actually got a lot of timber already. Wow, that was really fast. Let's go to our forager hut. We're going to pull this person off. Now we have one person available to build. We're going to go to our construction, go to the residential tab. The first thing we see is the burgage plot, level one. Now this one requires us to map it out manually. So I'm going to show you how to do this. If you were to build any kind of shape, certain shapes are better than others. Like you can make a triangle plot if you want. I, I usually recommend making square or rectangle-ish shapes. Maybe it doesn't have to be exact, but generally you're going to get the most efficient shape out of that. Now, depending on how big or how small you make this, it'll depend on what you're able to put inside. So right now we want to have a family. So you can see right here, just barely big enough to fit a single house. 
So this will fit a family in with three people. Now, if we make it a little bit longer, now you'll notice this back thing pops up. This is called an extension slot. This is something that we want to have on pretty much every single Burgager plot that we can get. The reason it's important is because we can harvest more resources from it, either food or maybe some higher end materials like weapons, armor, beer, things like that. So we want to make sure we have as many of these as available as possible so we can at least have the option to use it. So I, I recommend at least doing this. Now, if I were to make this a little bit wider and then do it again, now you can see it pulls up multiple houses. There are a couple options here. I can change the direction that the houses face. So this, this little arrow thing right here tells you where it's supposed to face the road. So if this is the road, we should really be facing it this way and it should be butted up against it exactly. So really it should look like this. You should do it right next to the street and then draw it out. And then you can see you could take it off the road if you want to do it some other way. But this is really what it should look like. There's also a plus and a minus button. If you press the minus button, you can actually take some of the dividers out and make one gigantic house with a big extension slot in the back. This is important for one and exactly one extension. It's the vegetable garden. Everything else, you want to have it the, the extension as small as possible because it doesn't make any difference to the production output. If it's small, if it's big, they all do the exact same. So that'll make sense later, a little bit more later, but just know that you want to you want to fit as many houses as possible and you want to get as many extensions as possible. So doing this has one one family. And if you the other thing I, for, I forgot to mention, if you make it slightly bigger than it would normally be, you could fit a second family on this plot. However, they share the extension slot. So you get two families, but only one extension slot. Now, if I push the plus button, it pushes it back up. Now I could fit four families in two extension slots, or I could put it back to the original. I could fit three families, three extension slots. So you can see there's sometimes if you just need a lot of people, you could technically get more people per land here, but you would get less ex extension slots. Again, I generally prefer to go this route, so we're going to go this route. In terms of where to build it, this is kind of a tricky one. You want to be somewhat close to your storage. And you also want your people to be somewhat close to all the industries because they do commute to work and then they come back home at some point. So what I'm going to do, I don't want to put it right here because I feel like we're going to need to put some industry right here. We're going to put some industry right here. This area in the middle looks like a perfect spot for housing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little offshoot and I'm going to hug this storehouse so we don't waste any space. And we're just going to put it straight back and then we'll start building houses right here. So if we leave a little bit of space, we can fit something right here. So I'm going to start it right here. Let's go out. And we only have enough timber to build three houses. So let's go ahead and drag it out and build three. And again, you have to, sometimes you have to adjust it a little bit here and there just to get it right. So we're going to do it like this. So this is three. We'll push the hammer. And that means there's three plots. Now, again, you have to have at least one unassigned person to work on it. So I took the person off the forging hut. Now they're ready to go. So I'm going to speed this up until these are getting close to being done. And we're just about finished with the third house. I'm going to slow it down here. Now, there's a couple things that happen. Every time you build a burgage plot, if you have available people, they will move in right away. If you have more houses than you have people, you have the potential for people to immigrate to your town. But there's a couple things that govern that. We're going to talk about it right now. So essentially, these people moved out of this little tent, this little starting tent, and they moved into the house, which makes them quite a bit happier. If you look up here, we had homelessness that was minus two debuff to our homelessness, which was giving us a negative approval. Negative approval is actually pretty bad. In the settings we have right now, it's not too bad, but if you do something more difficult, it's very easy to lose everybody in your town. They get pissed off and they just leave and you immediately lose the game. So I've had it happen to me several times. Again, not too big of a deal here, but it is kind of important because we want to keep it above a certain threshold. We want to keep our approval at 50% or higher so that we can get some positive immigration here. We want people to move in, but we obviously need more space for them to move in. We have five families and only three houses. So let's go ahead and build the next one. So I'm going to build another three. We only need five to keep everybody from being homeless, but we will have a sixth so that we can get some positive in immigration once we get our approval up higher. Now, you'll notice the, the approval is calculated by whatever your previous is plus your, your recent 30 days. So whatever number you see on the screen right now, there's only one and soon there'll be like six or seven numbers up there. You just add the whole thing up and that's what it determines what your approval is. If you have a negative in your approval, it actually carries over 
and it very slowly decays. So if you have a bad event that turns your approval down a lot, it can take a, it could do a lot of damage and be a long time before you turn that around. So you want to be very careful about that. And we'll talk about what affects your approval here soon. Homelessness is the only one affecting us right now. So that's why we're working on it first thing first. So let's keep this going. Again, we'll come back as soon as these are all done. And I'm going to pause it here for just a second because I feel like we could be a slightly more efficient here. As I mentioned before, this ox is definitely one of the bottlenecks. We are collecting quite a bit of timber now. So I'm going to pull this guy off of timber, or all three of these. And I'm going to switch them over to the forager hut for now. Let's reorganize it. We're going to leave one on timber, two on the forager hut, and then one person building. And we still have our third person over here doing the hunting camp. The other thing that we're going to need to build soon is the woodcutter's lodge. This is over here in the gathering tab. It's the second building. It only costs one log to build, so we're going to do that right away. And let's just put it right here because we do want to clear this woods out. This will be more of a temporary location. And we'll clear all this wood out. So the other thing we need to do is connect the roads. So we'll go ahead and put a road right here, connect it. It's just a small one. And when we're done, we can delete this if we don't, if this is going to look ugly. Because we're probably going to put some more houses over here. Maybe we'll put the church, the well, some other things here. But for now, we'll clear it out with the woodcutter's lodge first. So let's go ahead and speed it up. And like I said, as soon as this is done, we'll come back. So we built five out of five burgage plots. That's what we needed to go from, uh, I don't know, what's like a starting camp to a small village. So at each of these increments, you actually unlock a perk. So up here at the top, if you click on your town's name, you see this little one. That means we have one unspent perk point. So we're going to click on that, open it up. There's a bunch of stuff you can look at. I'll be honest, this is early access. Most of these don't work or are just terrible. So we're going to go over this later when it makes more sense to talk about it. For now, don't pick anything. You don't need to worry about it. Just be aware that it's there. And then there's a lot of stuff that we can look at. But again, if you look at it right now, you probably get confused and flustered or um, overwhelmed. So we're just going to ignore it. And again, anything that pops up, just click through it quickly. It's not important. Now, because we finished the first objective, they actually give you, in the, in the setting that we're on, they give you free weapons. So we have 30, 20 large shields and 20 spears. We can use this to create a militia at some point. Right now, we don't need it, but we will pretty soon. So it is kind of nice. We can start with a small army. We need to pair up those weapons and shield with people. And we just don't have enough people right now. We have only 10 males. And having a small army of 10 is not going to cut it. So let's speed this up. We'll start working on getting some positive immigration here so we can get our population increase and then we'll be in good shape. There we go. The last one is done. And you'll notice right here we have four assigned, one unassigned, but we have room for six. So this means we have room for one more person to join. You can always, if you just do the basic math, that's how you'll know if, if you've got room to grow. The other way you can look at it is right here. It'll say no population growth because our approval is low. Once our approval is high enough, it'll say that, that you will have low immigration. Now, at this point, we need to get rid of this homelessness, which we just did. Everybody's off the streets now, so that's good. That'll go away eventually. It'll linger for a little bit, but we'll get rid of it soon. There's a few things we can do to increase our approval so that people are more likely to come join us. The first thing and probably the easiest one to do and the most important one is to set up a marketplace. So if we go to our residential tab, this little one right here that has the other square, this is the other one that you can draw out manually. I'm going to pick that. So the main thing to keep in mind when you're placing your marketplace is you want to have it as centrally located as possible. You want to have it somewhat close to your supply depot, like your warehouse and your granary. You also, even more importantly though, it needs to be surrounded by all of your housing that needs these supplies. So if we put it right here, this would be good because it would, it would function to serve these houses. But the problem with this is we're not going to put houses on this side. So it would basically be wasted for anything on this side. It would cover only half of what we needed to cover. If we put it on this side, it will not only cover these, but anything we build on this side, it'll cover e equally. If we build a street down here and we put houses up here, it'll cover them. It'll cover basically all in like a 360 degree circle from here. Now, I don't know the exact length that it covers, but it's about, it will serve houses to about this distance. And it'll do it in, in some kind of radius. So if you look at something like this, it's about actually, you know what? Here, this is probably a better, a better visualization of what it covers. So if you look at this dot, if we were to put our marketplace right here, it would cover every house within about it's about this radius. Like I said, I haven't 100 percent measured it to the exact, but it's it's roughly about this distance. So we need to keep our housing in this distance, or we need to build more marketplaces that aren't getting the right coverage. 
So we're going to go ahead and build one. So the whole point of the marketplace is to connect your warehouses with the people that are actually going to use those goods. So what I'm going to do is build a place that can fit up to six stalls. So it's the same thing with the houses. You can adjust the shape and, and kind of get different counts. I like to make mine nice and even. And again, I only want to have six stalls. If you have too many stalls, you're going to get a bunch of vacant ones. And if you have too few stalls, you're going to have a supply shortage. So I personally have found that six locations is really good. Now, these market stalls will actually show up on their own. You do not build these. You just put the location for them to possibly show up. If there's somebody working in a building, they have the potential to open up a market stall. And you'll know they have a stall because when you click on the building they work at, they actually have this little symbol right here by their silhouette. So the hunting camp people actually have a stall up. The other way you can do it is, let's speed it up so they build it, and then I'll show you how to look at it. So it's it's built. If we click on it, you can see they have 50 storage here. You have the general, and once they get goods here, they'll show up right here. And more importantly, you have the people tab. So you can still see where they're at. You can see where they work. You can see where they live if you click on this button right here. Or you can see where they are personally. So you can see this lady's guiding an ox. This person's at the hunting camp. And this person is setting up the, the little market stall. Now, very important, we could do some other things like we can reassign family members. That's a little bit of a complex topic, but just be aware if somebody isn't quite where you want them, you can actually force them to work somewhere else. So we don't, we're not going to do that right now or probably anytime soon, but just be aware that it's a thing that you can do. So let's speed it up. We need to get our woodcutters lodge going and we need to put at least one worker there. And that pretty much concludes the initial setup. So at this point, if we were to walk away from the computer and do nothing, and let's just assume we didn't get attacked by bandits or any of that stuff, our colony would probably survive for a very long time because we have food income, we have firewood income, and we have housing. Those are the three most important things. If you don't have those, people will starve or freeze to death. But if you have those three and you have them in enough supply, they will usually deal with some of the other inconveniences if they're not happy about, like... Um, if you don't have a church or some other things they can get pissed off about. But basically this is, like I said, if you can get to this point, you can survive for a while. Now moving on to the next phase. The first thing and the most important thing to do in the early game is to get your population up very quickly. Now I mentioned before we have already one extra, but we want to have a few more. So we're going to go ahead and build some more. I'm going to do, let's do two more on this side. Actually, why don't we do, I guess it doesn't really matter. We could do two or three. Might as well do three because it looks like that's going to fit nice and even. Perfect. That'll put us at nine. So you see the six and then anything being built will be the plus sign. So that means we're going to end up with nine. We want to have at least one more. So we'll build one more right there. Now, one thing you'll notice, we have everybody working because our last person that was our construction worker, we actually put working on the woodcutter's lodge. Now, we don't want to take him off the woodcutter's lodge because I mentioned before, the most important thing for you to look at all the time is this one right here the number of months before your supplies run out. We have 16 months of food and we have only two months of firewood. So this woodcutter's lodge is gonna go collect firewood that these people burn to stay warm. So we absolutely cannot take him off because we only have two, two months of supply. We need to get that supply limit back up. So he'll collect firewood for us and bring that number up. We could pull somebody from the forager hut or we could pull from the hunting camp. I generally prefer to pull from the forager hut because the hunting camp gets both food and hides, whereas the forager hut only gets food. So we're gonna pull somebody from here and they're gonna go build stuff. And just like before, we're gonna speed this up and we'll come back when this is all done or something else interesting. So let's pause here for a second and take a look at our approval. You can see our approval is at 50%. So we're exactly in the middle. And if you hover over this right here, this is your total population. You'll notice that it went from neutral, not moving or whatever it says to low population growth, neutral approval. At exactly 50% or higher, you will get positive immigration. So you can see right here, we are going to have some immigration soon. You get one family per month if you have between 50 and 74. If you have 75 to 100, you get two families per month. And they they come in like halfway through the month. Uh, they don't come both at the same time. They're split up one and one. So basically like by halfway through the month, you'll get one. And at the end of the month, you get the other two. So right now it's... Probably not likely that we'll get our approval up much higher than this. So we can expect to get one new family per month. And you can see the months down here. We're currently in May and we started in March. So we're two months in. 
we'll probably get one month in May or one family in May, another in June, another in July, and then another in August. And I think we'll be capped out around August or September, something like that. So we'll go over the seasons and the months a lot more, but just be aware that that's a thing and that you can get one family per month if your approval is 50% or higher. So let's wait until these are all done and we'll come back. We are all done with the building. So we have exactly 10 houses. We have still only five families. We'll get somebody very soon. Let's take a quick look at the approval. We're getting a plus four because of market food variety. So anytime you have more than one types of food in the market, you're going to get a, a bonus. So you can see right here, we have three different types of food. We have berries, meat, and bread. And then if we look at the firewood stall, we have eight pieces of firewood. You want to have your marketplaces fully stocked because that's going to give you more approval. And it also satisfy what these people's needs are. If you click on a burgage plot on the residential tab, you can see a couple different things. Up here at the amenities, they want water access, they want church level, they want access to fuel, food, and clothing stalls. You can see for fuel, they only need one type. For food stall, at the level one burgage plot, they want two different food types. If they don't have two different food types, they do start to get a little upset. On this setting, they don't get upset unless they have no food types. And then the clothing stall, just one, one thing. And if you hover over this diamond, it'll tell you exactly what qualifies for this slot. So linen, leather, or yarn. We're going to be working on getting leather next. That's going to be our very next step. And then for the food, any of the food types, and you can see the food types right here. So meat, veggies, berries, bread, eggs, apples, and honey. You don't have to really worry about this stuff because we're going to go over this as we go. Most of these you will probably not see for a very long time. But the common ones like meat and berries we already dealt with. We have bread because we started with it. And then we'll, we'll be collecting some more soon. Now, the church and the water access we will fix soon as well, but that's going to be for a few more minutes. So in order to get our approval up higher, we need to give people clothing. So we're going to come down to our construction tab, go over to the industry, and then the fifth one over, this is going to be the tannery. This converts hides into leather, and we want to put that where the hides are coming from, which is going to be over here. Now, unfortunately, this hitching post is blocking, so I'm going to go ahead and move it. If you click on any building, some of them you're able to move and some of them you're not able to move. You have to deconstruct it and build it somewhere else. If you click on the building itself, you see this relocate button. If you click on that, we can actually move it. And I'm going to move it over to where our logging camp is because the logging camp is the building that most of the time ends up using it. So let's go ahead and put it over here. So we'll leave that right there. Somebody's going to come by and relocate it. And then we'll be able to put down our tannery. Now, again, I want to put it right next to the hunting camp because if you click on the hunting camp, you'll notice right down here, they have 11 hides in stock. So when this building is built, they will immediately go across the street, grab the hides and start working. If we were to build the tannery, say over here, they would have to walk all this distance to get the hides, bring them all the way back, do the work. And then when they convert them, they would have to take it all the way back to the storehouse or more likely the person, when we start putting people in these storehouses, they will have to come all the way back here, grab it, and put it back. You create a lot of inefficiencies by extending how long your logistics chain is. So we want to keep stuff nice and compact for the things that are of a similar nature. So like I said, hides go with the tannery. So let's go ahead and unpause, let these things catch up. Now we do have to deal with bandits. There are bandits on this map. It's the setting that we chose. They stole some of our firewood. I don't worry about this too much, honestly. It, there's nothing in here that, that we have that if they stole would be devastating to us. Everything we have is replaceable and it's really not a big deal, especially the firewood. You will be surprised at how quickly you can stack up a thousand firewood without even realizing it. And then it ends up clogging all of your inventory space. So don't worry about it. We obviously don't want them to do that, but don't freak out when they start stealing your stuff. It's not that big of a deal. Here we go. So our tannery's done. We're gonna go ahead and occupy it with somebody. We only have one family available and that's fine. We only want to put one person on. Now we'll see if we watch them, they're going to go across the street. They're going to grab those hides. They're going to throw them in here and start working on it. And if we click on general, we can see the general workflow of their inventory system. So they have hides. You'll see them disappear and out will pop leather. There you go. So they, they popped out. Now they converted it to leather. So what ends up happening with most of these buildings, this is not across the board, but almost all the production buildings, the family will do a couple different things. They will do, one person will actually work. And of course, when I'm trying to show it, they're not doing it. Okay, sorry, they had to go back up and build the clothing stall, unfortunately, but <laughs> I was trying to explain something. So almost all buildings follow this pattern. You'll see somebody 
within the family, there's three people. One person is going to be actually using the building and the other two people will be transporting things. So it's not that all three of them will craft. Only one of them is going to convert the hides over to leather and the other two people are going to do the, the bringing of the hides. So that's usually how it works. And if we were to assign more people to it, you would see it again with the same same thing with the family. One person would craft, two people would bring supplies back. Now, again, there's three different types of stalls that we talked about. There's one for food. And you can see we've got all types of food, the firewood. And we also have the final one that we just built for clothing. Now, they just got the leather produced, so they're going to bring it up here and then offer it for sale. But these are the three main types. There's no other stalls than this. And you'll generally get one of each. And because we have six free stall locations, if anybody wants to build a stall later, they will build more. In general, they follow a pattern where they have to have all three. These come in like a set, right? So if you have a one clothing, one firewood, one mark, and one food, food stall, and you build another marketplace, it's going to do the same thing. It'll have at least one clothing, one firewood, and one food stall. If you ever get stuck where it does not do that, you can click on the on the stall itself and destroy it, and then somebody else will come and build theirs. So if it's if you get something that's not balanced, just start destroying stuff and they'll build it back for free. It doesn't cost you anything. So just something to be aware of. In the early game, you probably don't have to worry about it, but it is something that does happen quite a bit in this game. So just be aware that that is something that that might happen. So let's let's keep going. Let's see what they do with this this leather. They're going to bring it back to the stall. So you can see them going all the way up there. They're going to take it to the stall and then some people will go across the street, grab the hides and bring it over. Now, over time, we are going to start to see this creep up a little bit, this approval rating. Right now, it's not quite doing it yet because we don't have enough clothing to satisfy the market. If you click on the marketplace outline, don't click on the stall itself, but click on the actual outline around it. It'll bring up this menu right here. Now, this has a couple interesting things. You can see the fuel. This market covers 100% of the fuel for this area. So if you look at it, we only have five families living right now in this area, and all five of them have wood supplied by this market stall. Food variety, same thing. They only need two because they're level ones, but they actually have three different food types, which is not necessary, but it does increase the, the approval rating. So that does help. And then you can see here, this is our problem right now is the clothing. So we have only five pieces of leather and they haven't all propagated to these. Now, the way these markets work is they basically teleport stuff to the houses without anybody having to do it. You will never see somebody take something from a stall and go drop it off at a house and you will never see somebody living in a house come and buy it from there. It just happens automatically. So don't don't worry about that. And you would think, OK, well, there's stuff in there. How come it's not going? It happens on a tick rate. I don't know what the tick rate is, but it's like maybe once or twice a month. There's a tick to check and see if there's enough stuff in the marketplace. So right now there's enough to satisfy what we got here, but it has the tick has not happened yet. So if we if we just sit here and watch it for a minute, you'll see that it will tick over and they will get what they need. So there goes one more person just got it. So we're at 60 percent. It ticked over again. Oh, it's it's giving it's giving close to the houses that are empty. <laughs> yeah, so it does supply the houses that are empty. So when as soon as somebody moves into those, they will be satisfied because they got everything they need. There we go. We're at 100 percent. So we have all, everybody has fuel, everybody has food, everybody has clothing, we're good to go. So we don't have to worry about that. And you can see it reflects in the, the approval rating, right? We get a plus six for food, plus two for clothing, and we should be having some positive migration here. I've been saying that for a while. I don't know what's going on. Somebody should have moved in by now, but we'll, we'll keep going. Now, the next thing we need to do is put down a church. The church is important because it's going to let us upgrade. You can see right here, these people want to have church and they want to have water access. All these others are satisfied, except for these two. If we satisfy these two, that'll allow us to unlock the upgrade, and we can go to the next level for this specific housing unit. And we need those upgrades so we can upgrade our whole town, right? We're going from a small village to a medium village, but we need to have two burgage plots of a level two or higher. So we're going to do this by upgrading this guy, and you know we'll upgrade two of these things. So let's work on getting a church. Now, the church needs some materials that we currently do not have. So we need five logs, 10 stone, and then 20 planks. We do not own planks right now. We need to make them. So the saw pit is the thing that makes planks. It's under the gathering tab. It's a third one over. And we always want to put it near one of our logging camps. So we're going to put it right here, right across the street, so they can just drag a log across and take care of it. Now, we don't have anybody working right now, so we do have to remove somebody. 
so that they can work. And then once they're done, we will have them do the the sawing. Okay, so we just got the pop-up. A new family started moving in to Bur Burgage Plot Level 1. So somebody just moved in. If you ever want to know where something happened, like let's say this clothing stall was built, if you click on this, this little plus sign, it's kind of hard to show you because as soon as I mouse over it, it goes away. But this thing right here, this is your, your pop-up messages. You can kind of scroll up and down to see what messages happen. And if you click on them directly, it'll tell you where the issue is happening. So storage is full for Woodcutter's Lodge. You can see that's a problem. We also got a new family moving in. So somebody moved into one of the empty houses. And now you can see it reflecting here as well. We have two unassigned, four assigned, 10 total living spaces. So this is six families. We started with five. So we're up one. There we go. So let's go ahead and put somebody into the saw pit. And they'll start working. They're going to go grab the ox and haul one of these logs over there and start cutting it up. Now, to build the church, we need 20 logs. Each one of these timber gets cut up and converted into five. So we basically need him to do four logs. That'll give us 20 timber and we can build the church. So we're just going to chill here for a minute and let that happen. Actually, while we're waiting for that, there's another interesting thing that we can do. And this is part of the early, especially the early game. It's very important to do a little bit of micromanaging. If you're not a fan of micromanaging, don't worry. You only have to do it for the beginning. And then once you get going, you can set your town up to be pretty much self-sufficient. You don't ever have to change anything and it'll keep chugging along. You might have to do maybe one or two things a year, but it's pretty rare if you set it up properly. Uh, I'm personally a fan of automation. I do not like micromanaging that much. I like to do a little bit of it and then I get tired of it. So believe me, we're going to be doing a lot of that here. So one thing, if you look up here, this, this message, this generic storage is full. That says that something is, is capped out. We can't do anything about this one because it only fit one. So that's not a big deal. But there was an issue down here with this one, the Woodcutter's Lodge. In order to get generic storage or any of these supplies out of the... Like the pantry has the food. If we want to get the food out of here or we want to get the firewood out of this building, it needs to get taken to the storehouse. These guys, as they get full, they will manually carry one at a time and drop it off at the storehouse, which is incredibly inefficient. Anytime you see something start to get full, if you have an available worker, you, you should pull them off and put them in the storehouse if it's a non-food item and the granary if it's a food item. So for example, this one is a non-food item. We put them in the storehouse and let's watch and see what they do. There we go. So this guy's transporting. You can see they immediately go right up here. So you'll see 49 out of 50. They're going to start grab some stuff. But more importantly, these warehouses have access to these hand carts. So you can see this guy's got a hand cart. The handcart can carry 10 of an item at once, whereas somebody carrying it by hand can only carry one. So it's 10 times more efficient to use the handcart. Very important to use your storehouses and your granary. It always feels gross putting somebody in a building that doesn't have any production, but believe me, you do want to do this from time to time to clear your stuff out because anytime these guys aren't able to produce because they have to spend time taking it back is lost efficiency. So if you can have somebody come by with a handcart, clear it out after two or three trips, it's going to be a lot better for you. So we'll watch this guy. So right now you can see this thing's at 47. By the time the hand cart gets through with it, it's going to drop by 10. So 37 and there are two hand carts here. So the second hand cart is coming in right behind them. So you'll see this go down from 38 down to 28. And there you go. So she's going to haul that back. And like I said, all that will live in the storehouse and it'll be centrally located to all the other stuff that we're going to have going on. Now, we're waiting for our planks, so let's just hang out for a little bit and let the planks build up. Now, we pulled everything out of this woodcutter's lodge, so there's nothing left. There's not really much for the storehouse to do. I guess they could... Yeah, they're, they're, actually, there's literally nothing for them to do. Uh, or I guess they could pull the planks, but that's not a big deal, because we're going to use them right now. So what I'm going to do is we're going to pull this guy out of the storehouse, and let's see what our forger hut... Yeah, see, the forger hut is almost full, so they're going to run into that same issue where they can't do anything until they clear out the pantry. And then same thing here, the pantry is getting full. So let's go ahead and put that unassigned family into the granary. And they're going to do the exact same thing, but this time for the food building. So let's see where they go. So here you can see the cart is going to grab 10. And he just went to this. It's going to take it down to 13. There you go. So like I said, using these storehouses is very important. Otherwise, you're going to get some clogged buildings. And then they will be very inefficient. Now he's going to go grab the berries. And you'll see soon... All that inventory is going to be located here in the middle. Now, we did finish our planks, so let's go ahead and pause it again. Let's get the guy off the saw pit. Unless you're using the, the planks for a specific trade good or something like that, like if you're building bows or some of those things, 
I don't recommend keeping somebody in the saw pit because it's very easy to just go overboard and have like hundreds of planks and you're going to use up all your timber because like I said, they pull timber from this building over here to saw it into, into planks. So you, you want to keep as much of your timber available so you can build buildings. So generally, don't keep people in the saw pit unless you know you're going to use it. So in this case, we know we're going to use it for church. Let's go ahead and do that. Now, the church doesn't have to be connected to anything. It can be just about anywhere. I, I like to keep it relatively close to where my people are living just because they will go to the church to pray and stuff like that. We don't want them walking across the map. It's kind of wasteful. But we also don't want to put it on valuable territory right here. Like we could put industry right here where it's actually useful. There's nothing that's produced out of the church. Don't have it clog up all your stuff. So in this case, we could put it near, let's see, I think. Yeah, most of our stone is right there, actually. And we still need to get the planks. So why don't we do this? Let's put the church back over here. But we want to get the planks closer to the building location so they're not walking all this distance. So what I'm going to do is actually put somebody in the storehouse. And let's see if they go pick up those planks. Because that's going to give us a bit of efficiency. They're going to take 10 at a time. The builders that would go pull it over here are going to do one at a time. That's very inefficient. So we want to avoid that. And of course, they're going to stock up on all this little stuff here in the in the meantime. But they will go. Yep, here they go. So they're going to go yank all the planks. This is going to be all 20 all in one go. Because there's two carts. Beautiful. Now we can turn this off. And now we have these builders again. We're going to build the church right here. So I'm going to put it far enough back so that it's not quite in the way of anything. And we could still fit some housing or something back here if we really need to. I think something like here is probably decent. And we got another family move in. So that's our second new family. That's good. Now we did pull somebody off of the logging camp. But we're still doing okay on timber. You can see we got 22. That's probably plenty for now. Checking in on our number of months before supplies run out. We are actually in very good shape. We've got a lot of food. We've got a lot of fuel. The one thing that you do have to be wary of, we have a lot of immigration happening right now. So we had only five. We picked up two more families in the last two months, and we're going to pick up three more in the coming months. So that means there's more mouths to feed and there's more fires to burn in all these houses. So we need to make sure that we have enough to, to deal with that increased supply. So if we were to take on those three people right now, we would probably cut our fuel down by another two months. The food would get cut down by maybe six or seven months. So again, you just have to be wary of that if you're going to be doing a lot of quick expansion. But I think right now we're good. We don't have to worry about it too much. But like I said, you want to get in the habit of checking this every once in a while. So we don't really need a second set of builders. Let's just put another person back on that forger hut. The reason I like to put people in the forger hut more than I put on the, the hunting camp or some of the other ones is because this resource is seasonal. It will eventually go away. If you If you hover over the berries, you can see... Right now, it's not growing anymore, so we have only 24 out of 64 left to gather. Once this thing's empty, we need to pull everybody off of this for the un, until it starts growing again in the next spring, I think it is. Yeah, spring. But it'll sit dormant for the next, you know, nine months, basically. And we can't really use the forger hut at that point. So let's just get it done with. We'll pull these people out. We can use them for other stuff soon. Now, you can probably tell why I wanted to build the church near all these supplies, because there's a lot that needs to come out. Now, all these get taken out one by one by hand. So 20 planks, 10 stone. That's 30 people that need to bring something out. And then, you know, the timber. That's the ox traveling back and forth five times. So it really does take a while. It, it helps if you, build, if you build it close to where your, your stores are, where everything is. So that's why I did that. But let's speed this up so we can finish. Now, we did actually get a notification here. If you look up here at the top, this question mark, this is what I was just talking about. This forger hut can no longer do any useful work because the berry hut is completely gone. So we're going to pull both of these guys off. We'll find something else for them to do. How are we doing on timber? We are good. We don't have to worry about that. Again, we're still doing okay on firewood. Food is doing okay. So I don't think we really have to worry about too much. What I'm going to do is let's stack up a few more planks just because I know at some point we will, we will need them. But I'll probably pull them off pretty soon. We just don't want too many people sitting sitting around idle. You probably don't need more than one family building stuff, but we'll have two families helping to do this because this is kind of a big project, actually. So we'll get it done quickly. The other thing that we're going to need is a well. Why don't we get that set up? So the well is for, obviously, water. So under your residential tab, it's the second building. It only costs one timber. It's not too bad. We can actually put it near the church. So why don't we put these two together? Mash made in heaven. No pun intended. And we'll wait till these two are done. Now, we did get a pop-up here that slowed the game down. Usually, that means there's something military-related. And sure enough, there's a bandit camp that was sighted. So if we click on this, it'll it'll take us right to where it is. 
I don't know where that is on the map, so let's zoom out. It is right in the very middle of the map, actually. We're pretty close to it. Now, we don't have a whole lot of people that we can rely upon for troops. We have 14. I generally don't re recommend doing that. If you send too few troops, they're going to get chewed up. You'll still win the battle, but you're going to end up burning through a lot of your people, and you'll end up burning through your supplies, your, your weapons. And since we can't produce these right now, it's pretty costly to lose them. So let's wait until we get a full 20, and then we'll send them out to clear it up. And we are getting more people move in, so there's another family just came. We we're up to eight. We need two more, and we'll be full based on all the, the houses that we have available right now. There we go. The well is done, and the church is finishing up, so we should be good. Now, that is going to do a couple things for us. The church will add more to our approval rating. It doesn't do it yet, but over time, before the end of the month, we should see a little bit of a bonus in here, and then over time, that'll add up. So that'll help increase our immigration rate. And then again, the well, it doesn't really do anything. I think it's kind of a little bit of a placeholder right now. You need it for people to be happy for their upgrade. But beyond that, it doesn't add approval. It doesn't take away approval. People don't die if they don't have a well. It's like I said, it's, it's more of like a, a placeholder at this point, I think. They do visit the well, though. So you again, same thing like the church. You don't want to put it in the corner of your, your region because then they're going to be walking all that way to get to it. So, you know, have it kind of close to your build, your housing, but don't put it in the way of anything that you plan on having important infrastructure going on. So we put them up over here on the hill. So we're good. If we click on our Burgage plots again, we can see we have the option to upgrade to level two and we do have the resources. So everything here is satisfied and we need four logs. We have four logs ready to go. So let's upgrade. Let's upgrade. We need to get two of them. So let's go ahead and do it twice. Now, when I when it comes to upgrading, I usually pick the ones that are closest to the marketplace because they're going to be the ones that are most dependent on their happiness is most dependent on being close to the marketplace. They're going to require more food types. They're going to require more clothing types. They're very finicky. So I generally like to put them closest to the marketplace. Now, we have a bunch of people not really doing anything. So let's just put them somewhere. Let's put a couple on this logging camp. Actually, why don't we do this? We don't have anybody for our storehouse or our granary. Let's put some people in there on the granary and the storehouse. And one thing that we can do, I, I generally, this is a little bit more of an advanced thing to keep in mind, but I am going to talk about it because I feel like it is super important. Uh, and it took me a really long time to figure this out. So the problem with having somebody run a market stall is that you get one person in here doing absolutely nothing productive other than obviously keeping the market stall um, occupied which is kind of important but as far as like doing this stuff that they're supposed to be doing like hunting these people are supposed to be hunting cutting up the animal getting meat and all that stuff they're supposed to be doing that but obviously this person can't do that because they're over there goofing off in their market stall and making money so we generally don't want to have people in production buildings running a stall that is it's doable you can get away with it but it's very inefficient so generally what you want to do is you want to have somebody that's working in a storehouse or a granary do that because look at how much food they have access to. They already work here, so they're already hanging out here anyways, and they have access to all this food. If they work here at the hunting camp, look at what food they have, they have access to. They have nothing. So generally you want to you want to avoid that. So what we're going to do, the easiest way to do this is to take away the worker from the hunting camp. So we'll take them away, and then we want to make sure it's the person at the granary having it. It won't automatically do it, but what you do is you take this in one away and don't add it back to the hunting cap. You want to add it back to the granary first, and then you'll see it gives it to the granary. The other way you could do it, and I'll show you the other way just in case it's just in case it makes more sense to do it that way. Oh, uh, it took it away, didn't it? Yeah, it. it <laughs> see if we can get it back. No. Okay, we can't get it back. But anyways, let's say if this was reversed, the other way you could do it is you could actually go to here and reassign the family member and you could just and they, let's say they were working at the hunting camp and you resign you would click on the granary and it would reassign them here and they would keep that marketplace so that's another way you can do it but like i said we're good he's here the other thing is the storehouse we want the storehouse to have it too so who should we take it's either going to be the woodcutter or the tanner the problem with the tanner is the tanner doesn't have that much work to do they kind of have to be there at all times Whereas this guy right here, the woodcutter, is constantly going back and forth dropping stuff off. Because they cut a lot more wood than, you know, let's say this guy will drop off maybe 5 to 10 pelts a month, something like that. This woodcutter is going to cut like 40 a month. So it's it's this guy's got a lot more to worry about. So what we're going to do is we're going to take him away. 
And then same thing. Actually, no, let's do it this way this time. So we'll show you the other way. So we want to have him work at the storehouse. So we're going to go to the people tab. We're going to reassign the family and we're going to put him right back here to the storehouse. And then we're going to take away this storehouse family and it'll always take away the family first that does not have a stall. So if there's five families and only one has a stall, you can click it four times. It'll take everybody away except for the one with the stall. And then we're going to put him back on the woodcutter lodge. And now we've got it reorganized. So this is exactly what we want. We've got two stalls being run by the people running the storehouse and the granary. That's perfect. You can see right here, this guy's got access to both firewood and leather. So if at some point he needs to do the leather stall too, he could do that. So we're in good shape. Let's go ahead and unpause. And we're just waiting for these two to upgrade and then we'll be in good shape. There we go. We've got two houses upgraded to Burgage Plot level two, which is enough to qualify for the medium village. So we unlocked another perk. Again, we're not going to talk about this just yet, but we do have two perks to pick at some point. Now, the difference between a Burgage Plot one and a Burgage Plot level two, there's a couple things. If you notice right here, Burgage Plot level one has less amenities and market supply that they require to be happy. This is what they need to be perfectly happy. You can see this guy is not unhappy, but he's not happy yet, right? So we need to get Tavern with Ale. We need to get our church upgraded. And we need to get another source of clothing to them, either shoes, clothes, or cloaks. So one of those three need to be supplied to the market, and then they'll be fully satisfied down here. Uh, these two, we're going to spend quite a bit of time getting these fixed up. That's going to be the next, uh, the next task. But like I said, you can see... You don't want to immediately upgrade everything that you have because it makes them more needy and it uses more resources. So for example, going from level one to level two uses a lot of ale. These guys drink a lot. These people at Burgage Plot level one do not drink. So it's it's a pretty big difference. And then same thing with the clothing stall. They will burn through these types of clothing pretty quickly. And if we didn't have that, we could sell it and make a lot of money. So it's just, you have to be a little cautious with what you're upgrading. You don't want to do too much all at once. So we are moving on to the next section. We are halfway through. Not time-wise, but section-wise, we're halfway through. <laughs> this is the part where it slows down a little bit, but that's because it's a lot more involved and it actually gets a lot more fun. So first thing we need to do now is we need to get one more house so that we can get another person moved in here. Like I guess if we need a full complement of troops, right now we only have 18. So if we come down here, we need to actually defend our property because we did get stolen from a couple times. And we don't want that to have uh, to keep happening. You can see right here, there's still that one bandit site. And there's actually another one down here. So there's two bandit sites. Now, there's another reason why it's actually better. If you're nervous about playing with bandits and having to fight people, it's actually easier to play with bandits on because they offer huge benefits when you take them out. And I'll, we'll be going over that in just a second. But like I said, this is the right choice, in my opinion, is to play with with even just a little bit of light combat it's it's much better so right now we need to start our militia we have equipment that we can use we have large shields and spears so if we come here to our army tab or the hotkey we press v you press this create new unit button and then we have the option to create footmen spearmen pole arms or archers we only have the equipment to do spearmen so we're going to go straight for the spearmen and you can see we actually have enough equipment to do 20, but we don't have enough people to do 20. So we need another family to move in. And actually, while we're waiting, we don't want to be inefficient and, you know, not getting work done. Once we go off to do some fighting, we are going to want to have something going on here. So why don't we do this? Let's go ahead and create a couple more houses. You can see we have to do a kind of a funky shape because I, I what do they call it? You paint yourself in the corner. I kind of messed up with this one. So we're going to do it at a weird angle. We, let's get two more houses in there. That'll bring our total up to 12 when that's all done. So let's get started on that. And as soon as this next family joins, we will go off to war. Ah, uh, we just got stolen from again. They stole some berries and they stole leather. Ouch, that's expensive. So yeah, we like I said, we're going to take them out next anyways. It's not a big deal. It really isn't. And we'll end up getting all this stuff back anyways. Here we go. We got our 10th family and we just finished our... Uh, was that our 12th burgage plot so we have room for two more now let's take a look at our approval it has been going up it has been going above 75 but it's not constantly above 75 so i think you have to stay above 75 for it to actually work properly like if you if you go above 75 for a split second i don't think it really does that much but anyways yeah we're, we're still positive it doesn't matter very important we can go ahead and summon our militia here so we can go take out those bandits you always want to make sure if you're at least 
if you're trying to get a big population or get to a, a reasonable amount, you want to always make sure you stay ahead of your, your population. So right now we have 10 families and we have room for two more to move in. So we have basically two months supply of housing. If we get behind on that, like let's say we had only 10 houses and we have 10 families, that means nobody can move in. We have to sit there and build the building and that takes, you know, half a month or a month or whatever. That's that you basically just missed out on that month's supply of, of immigrants if you don't have the house ready to go. So just be aware that always try and have a little bit of, of room ahead. So maybe what I usually do is I'll build groups of like five or six. And then when I start to get close to that, I'll have maybe two or three houses left. I'll build another set. And then when I get down to one or two open, I'll build another set. And then when I get to the desired limit, then I'll stop. But that's that's generally something that you want to keep in mind is stay ahead of your immigration curve. Have empty empty houses ready to go. But because you're doing that, make sure you also keep enough food and, and uh, fuel ready to go as, as well. So let's go ahead and pull our army together. We're Actually, let's wait another couple seconds. For some reason, it's at 19 and not 20. What happened here? Somebody gets sick. Somebody might have gotten sick or something. I've actually never seen that before. But anyways, let's let's get him out. Now, in order to summon your troops, you click on... Oh, there it goes. So we have 20 out of 20. So in order to summon your troops is you click on them. And then there's this button right here, the rally button. And then you have to click somewhere on the map. It could even be anywhere on your region. You can go to the corners, wherever we're going. We're going to be heading to... Let's see. There's a bandit camp there and a bandit camp there. Let's go for this one since it's close. So we're going to go right there. The first thing you should automatically do is click on your unit that you just summoned and turn off the running. If you see right here, this says run to positions. It's going to you don't want that at all. It's going to use up a lot of the stamina for your unit. So it's it's a really bad idea to leave that on. So immediately pause the game, summon your people and get them on walk mode. You don't want them running everywhere. So we're going to speed this up. Now, what ends up happening if you look here, we have 20 people from our population out of a 30 total. So we basically just took out two thirds of our population to go to to go do battle. So that means that if you look at these two of these people where it says waiting and they've got the white thing over their their picture, this means they're soldiers. So these people are basically not contributing to the colony or to the town other than, you know, whatever they're doing off fighting. So everything's being run by the women now. And there's only one before there was four three people running this place. So there's a lot of, inef your, your town basically becomes inefficient and it slows down to a crawl. So you do have to be wary of that. You wanna generally not have your militia out for very long. You wanna use them and then get them back as fast as you can. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna speed up this thing all the way till we get close to them. Now, as you get close to the enemy, they will pop out of their little, uh, their little tents and they'll start running at you. So we'll see them pop out here in just a minute. There they go. So they're out. They're coming. So we're going to slow it down a little bit. And what we want to do is we want to get our unit ready to fight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select them. And if you right click and drag, you can see we can make a long skinny line or we can make it all bunched up. I generally like to keep a flank on the enemy. So I want to have a longer line than they do if possible. And in this case, we can because the brigands, the people that we're fighting just kind of they kind of go as like a like a knotted ball or something it looks like a mess so we're gonna let them charge into us now let's talk real quick about combat i don't want to go too deep on this but we will talk about a couple things if you hover your mouse over anybody's unit yours included and you hold the tab button a little drop down will show up all this stuff that's going on so if you look right here going from top to bottom these are the brigands they're in the outlong clan they're currently moving and they're set to defense and they're running that's the stuff at the top that's that means that white flag with the white bar, that is their morale. If the morale goes down low enough, they will stop fighting. And if it goes any lower, they will flee from the battlefield. They're completely gone. You can't use them anymore. Now below that, there's some modifiers for what is going on here between this battle. So they have an experience modifier to the morale of plus 25. They also have an army power balance of plus 22. I don't know why that is. And they're getting a morale debuff of minus 10. And then the bottom, that little lightning bolt, that is their stamina, basically. As they run and fight, they will use stamina. As they walk, usually if you're sitting still, you will recover your stamina. I think you can recover very slowly if you walk. I could be wrong on that. Yeah, it's it, you generally want to be standing still to recover your stamina. And then if you look below that, there's a bunch of stats. There's basically six stats. Attack, armor, charge, anti-armor, shield, and impaling. Attack is what it sounds like. It's the amount of damage they do. Armor is how much your it's pretty standard stuff like how much damage your armor absorbs 
charge is what kind of bonus you get when you actually charge into somebody. It's the initial attack you get a bonus, and then it basically does nothing once you're stuck in battle. So it's only for that initial charge. Anti-armor is if you take out, obviously, if you take out armor, like if you've got a mace or something. Uh, the arrow thing is the shield. That's how much armor you have against ranged weapons. So archers at this point is the only thing that's in the game that's ranged. And then impaling. This is how much bonus you get for stopping somebody that's charging you. Now, to get the impaling bonus, you have to be stopped. If you're moving, you do not get it. So these guys, these brigands, they do actually get a charge bonus when they attack. But if we look at our units, our spear militia, they have only one attack. But to their benefit, they have 10 impaling. So they have a massive bonus to people that are charging into them. So you generally don't want to charge into a spear militia if the enemy is stationary. If they're moving, charge away. No big deal. Or charge at their flanks. You don't want to charge the front. Uh, we also have army balance of power. We do get a little bit of a buff because our units are much better than theirs. So we have a morale advantage here. We don't do as much damage, but we have a pretty significant lead in armor. And then, like I said, the impaling is a huge, huge difference. They're going to get hit pretty hard when they charge right into us. And then at the very bottom, you see the effectiveness. So you get effectiveness, what percentage of your stats are actually in play. So Right now, we actually are doing more damage than we than our unit is supposed to do because our effectiveness is higher than it is. As soon as we get into combat, that's going to dip down. It'll be at like 70 or 80%. And then as combat goes on, it'll go down lower and they get less and less effective. You got to rest, let your people rest. So let's let this go nice and slow. Like I said, we'll see this charge happening. And then they're just going to get really hurt here because like I said, we have Impale, which is going to hurt them badly. So you can see our effectiveness just went down below. We're, we dip below 100%. They have 16 and we have 20. So not only do we outnumber them, but we have better equipment and we basically counter what they just did. So we should be in good shape here. The combat is decent. Um, it's pretty repetitive when you zoom in and you watch them. I mean, some of the animations are pretty good, but if you watch it enough, you, you notice it's kind of repetitive. So I usually just zoom out and skip through it. So I'm going to kind of do that right here. So let's speed this up. And you can see they lost some people. They're losing. Their morale is ticking down hard. I'm going to slow it down here. You see the morale. They're basically at half. Every time they lose somebody, they are losing morale. And they're just about broken at this point. Oh, we lost somebody. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, we actually lost somebody. I've done this run like six times, trying to tweak it here and there. I've never lost somebody doing this, so that's kind of funny. But it's okay. Losing one person is not the end of the world. Now, as soon as the battle's done, we want to rush over there and get to that bandit camp. Because there's a bonus waiting for us. So let's get there. There we go. So we get a pop-up message. The camp goes away. And we get to either get resources for our town or we can put it in our own personal pocket. Now, in general, you can't really go wrong either way. I think in this playthrough, it's much better and easier to use it if it's if the town owns it. So let's give it to the town. If you give it to yourself, you can use it to buy mercenaries. You can use it to start new settlements when you own more land. But I, I don't think it's that important right now. I'd rather have the money in the town because we could use it to trade. So let's go ahead and do this. We'll send it to the nearest town. And then you can see right here, it actually gave us 129 wealth for that. That's pretty good. And then if you look right here, we got a lot of our stuff back. So we got a bunch of our, our firewood. We got some meat and then the three leather that they stole. So we got all that stuff back, but we're not done yet. We got to come down here and take out this camp. So again, we're going to move where we're close, but not right on them because we want to be standing still to get that um, that impale bonus off. So we're going to speed five this till we get down there and we'll come back. Now, it's kind of funny. We lost a man and usually it's two males, one female per family. So that's why we have 30 people. We have 10 houses, two of each family. So 20 males, 10 female. But you'll notice we lost a guy, but now we have 20 males. So that lady that uh, died, that had their husband die, she already got remarried. Um, you know, there's no, <laughs> there's no downtime here. You just, uh, you, life goes on, right? So losing people isn't the end of the world. You do get them back and you get them back at a fairly reasonable rate. So don't worry about losing people. Really the thing we want to worry about is losing our equipment because it's pretty expensive. So preferably we don't want to lose people. So we're going to sit here. It's going to allow us to get our breath back just a little bit. And more importantly, we're going to be able to use that impale stat because like I said, we are spears and we got 10 impale. Let's make sure they go from the front, and that's exactly what they're going to do. Let's get a good look at this. Actually, you can go into cinematic mode if you hold control and press C. You can see right here, look at this. It's nice, epic. And then the screen shake. 
And like I said, this isn't the most enthralling gameplay, so I'm just going to speed this up. Get this battle over with. Yeah, we broke him. So we actually didn't lose anybody that time, despite having less people this time. So that's that's the norm. If you have 20, you will generally not lose anybody taking out these bandit camps. But it's not uh, not a guaranteed, as, you can, as, as we saw earlier. So let's take out that camp, and let's make sure there's nobody else. If you zoom all the way out, it, sometimes it won't let you zoom out. If you're selecting a unit, it stops you from going all the way out. So what you have to do is press escape and then zoom out again or just press M. M is the hot key for the map. So that's another way you can do it. So what we're looking for is those little bandit camp symbols. I don't see any else. I don't see any other ones. So I think it's just this one. We can go back and then continue our progress. So let's get this over with. There we go. We got it. And again, we're going to send it to the town as well. And that gives us another 156. And we got our, let's see, we got our, yeah, our firewood and our berries back. Not bad. Now, when you are going back, when you know you're not going to fight anymore and you're going back for the day, you can run, run your guys ragged. Just let them get fatigued. It doesn't matter. You want them back at town as soon as you can. If they get fatigued, it's not a big deal because they're going to be disbanded anyway. So who cares? So use them up. And we got another family joining us, so that is 11 out of 12. So we should probably build another house soon. I don't think we will want to go too crazy because we will start to run into issues with not having enough food and, and whatnot. But I, let's just wait for the men to come back. We'll disband and then we'll start working on the next phase of this. There we go. And if you, if you have somebody selected and they go from not your territory to your territory, it'll still have the disbanded unit grayed out. So what you have to do is just click off and then click them again, and then you can disband. It's kind of a silly bug, but yeah. So if you're if you're holding onto them the whole time and they cross, just click off and then and you can disband them. So disband, they're going to immediately drop all their stuff. And you can see they're back in their civilian outfits. They're going to go back to whatever jobs they were doing. So pretty cool. I, I really like how they did that with this game. You know, using the people that are actually building your town. You can see them go fight. It's kind of uh, sad when they die. You actually feel something. And until the, until the wife gets married, like... One day later, after the husband's dead, not even back from the body's not even back from the battlefield. And she's already getting married. So the next thing that we need to do is make sure that we have enough units to handle another bandit camp, which I think we do. 19 is probably fine, but we want to most likely fill out the rest of this unit, get up to 36. So we're going to need more people and we're going to need more equipment. So what we're going to do is set up a trade network. Now, one issue that we're going to have with trade here is we built this road. It's disconnected from the main road. This main road is generated every time it's it's on the map every time. This is called the King's Road. Here we go. Let's go to our trading post. You have to put your trading post on the road to get passive traders walking by. If you put it off, let's say you put it over here, you have to pay somebody to come by and pick your stuff up or, or drop stuff off. Whereas if you do it right here, they will do it automatically without you having to pay for it. So it generally, you kind of want to be here if you can. Uh, it, it's it's kind of a, a hassle to have to uh, supply stuff all this distance, but it's fine. We can do it. We can connect the road right here. So let's do that. And then we're going to build a trade post. Now, again, don't put it on the side road, even if you're technically like right next to it. Make sure it's actually attached to this road. So we're going to put it maybe on this side, just like that. And we have a lot of people working here that are not working. Sorry, we have four people that are unassigned. You know what we could do is we could upgrade this this warehouse. Right now it has only 250 storage. It's really bad. If we upgrade it, it'll go 10 times that to 2,500. It's very easy to overstuff your storehouse, whereas the granary needs quite a bit to, to oversupply. So generally you're going to run out of storehouse space before you run out of the other ones. So if you click on it, the little circle that was right here, we click on it, that'll upgrade it. And it's not super expensive, so I, it's recommended doing somewhat early on. We'll, we'll go and do it right now because we we're just about at the cap. So let's let those two buildings finish, and then we'll figure out what to do next. We got another family, so we're at 12. We're actually at the limit. We need to build another house. Why don't we do that right now? What I'm going to do, actually, these trees, there's not very many trees back here anymore for this woodcutter's lodge to handle. So what I'm going to do is move him somewhere else. It's kind of tough right here. He's going to chew out all these trees. And it'll probably scare the hunt away. It's fine. I don't mind it too much, though. Let's go ahead and do that. It's going to be directly across the street for the, uh, the storages. So that's probably not a bad idea. Now, to get rid of a road, like I said before, this was a temporary road. You click on the road button. If you hold the alt and then left click, it will actually give you the option to remove. So now we can build a new road. 
I'm going to continue this straight for a little bit. Actually, you know what? Maybe not. Yeah, actually, why don't we make an angle down here because we can build some houses right here and it's still a pretty close distance to the fire stall. So maybe we build like two houses right here. We don't want to go too far away from this because then they won't be in range. So this should be good right here. And then we can build a few more houses up here once this supply thing is gone. Now, we are running low on timber. We only have three left. So I'm going to put another two people in the logging camp just to speed that up a bit. The other thing that's slowing this down is actually the, the oxen. We don't have a whole lot of oxen to spare. So why don't we build another one? We could build, it's called a hitching post. Under the, logis the logistics tab, it's going to be the one all the way in the right. We see hitching post. It only costs one. And it usually is going to originate somewhere over here because that's where all the logs are. So let's go ahead and build it over here. Now you don't automatically get an animal with it. You actually have to, you just get the building and you have to order the animal. They cost money. They cost 20 gold for this one. The horses cost 30. Horses only work with trade posts and actually they don't technically work. It's bugged right now. So don't ever buy a horse. Not until they fix it. Just worry about buying ox and we want to buy as many as we have space for. Now, if you're not sure how much room you have in your hitching post, you can click on it. It'll say one out of one stable space. If you have them spread out all over the place, the easiest place to look is up here, this little horseshoe. It'll tell you how much. So like right now we have one out of two. So we have one, one ox and we have two available space. So we can order one more, which is what we just did. So when they comes, it'll be two out of two. Now, I don't feel bad about spending money because we just made a bunch killing those bandits. In the early game, you only start with 50 and that's not much. You generally don't want to spend that. Uh, I like to save it for emergencies, like if we need to upgrade some of these buildings or something. Um, but for the most part, yeah, once you get a little bit of cash, definitely get some oxen, upgrade them. Might even make sense to buy two. I think two total should be fine. There we go. Our hitching post is done and the ox is already here. He's already taken a bunch of stuff around. So you can see he's going to, to pick up the logs. Now we're basically going to double the speed at which we deliver the, the logs by. And we finished our upgrade. So you can see the storehouse. Not only do you get 10 times the storage space, but you can, you can assign two more people. So before we were only able to assign two. Now we can assign four total. We don't have that many people here, so we don't really need it. But it is nice to have that option. So we'll put a second person in here in the large storehouse because, again, we have one stall for firewood, one stall for clothing, and then one stall for food. So we don't want to have too much more than that. We don't need to have five stalls. We really only need three for now because we have enough to supply all these guys. So our trading post is just finishing up now. And what we're going to do is secure our future at this point. We got plenty of money. I don't think we have to worry about that too much. But we do want to get a few more weapons just so we can replace that loss that we had. And then also as our population expands, we need to get more people uh, weapons to use. So because we're going to be importing goods right now, we don't actually need somebody to work there. Somebody will come by, drop the stuff off, and then we can come pick it up manually. So we don't need to use a worker here. What we're going to do is if we click on our trade post and then we come down here to the trade tab, we're going to go to the military tab all the way at the end. And you can see right here, we can buy some spears and we can buy large shields. So those, those are the two things we're looking at. Don't worry about looking at anything else on here. Just large shields and spears. If you look at these numbers, we have an import and an export price. So if we were to export this, or sorry, backwards, that's export and import. So if we were to sell our spears, we would get seven gold for each. If we were to import them, they would cost us 17 each. So you can see there's a pretty big spread there. It's more than double. But before we do that, what we can do is we could actually trade them. And actually, before you do any of the trade, you have to, for certain items, it requires a route because this is a big item. This is, um, you know, any of the military items, any of the high-end the high -end production goods, these all require a trade route to even do it. Some of these lesser items don't, but you can see here on the materials, a lot of the stuff we're going to do, like the leather, we have a bunch of leather we could sell. We have to open a trade route to do that. Now, what this means is trade route means somebody specifically comes off the map to do your trading on that specific item and then they get out and then they come back and then they get out. They do it infinitely. The other traders are the ones that just randomly walk by. And if they if you have something that they want, then they'll you sell it to them. But otherwise, you, you could get traders that walk by without buying anything. So if you do the trade route, it's much more efficient because you have somebody that's all they're doing is going there and that all they want is the item that you contracted them for. But before we do any of this, we need to open up our trade routes. So it's going to cost us 42 for this one and then 34 for this one. But again, don't do this yet. Let's go ahead and do a perk. So come up here. 
to the, the town that you're in up at the top, you click on it. We're going to unlock two different perks. We're going to unlock this one right here, Trade Logistics. It's on the right hand side. And then we're going to unlock better deals. So we're going to take these two perks. These are probably some of the better ones in the game. There's some other ones that are pretty good too, but these ones are really good. Maybe a bit overpowered, but you know, I'm sure it'll get nerfed at some point. But for now, we take those two. Now, if we come back to our trade, you'll notice a big difference. There's only one price. Import and export price is now the exact same. And we are locked into spending only 25 per trade route. Now, this is really important because while we could afford the other ones that, that we had, we're going to be opening up like four or five trade routes. Every time you click one trade route, the next one gets even more expensive. So you could have trade routes that are costing you, you know, 150, 250, even up to like 500. I mean, they can get very expensive if you're opening up a lot of them. So this really caps that a lot, especially in the early game. It's important because we only have 600 to spend and we have to spend 50 of it opening these up. So we're going to open up the spear trade and the large shield trade. So we'll do those two. Very important before you leave the screen right now, it's set to no trade. We want to import these things. And then you have a couple things to look at. You have this button, which is your, or this number, which is your current supply. And then an arrow to your desired surplus. So this basically in like layman's terms, this is how many you have, and this is how many you want to have. And once you reach this number of what you want to have, anything above it means that the trade will be shut off. They will not buy anything or they will not sell it to us. So like, let's say for example, if we have 20 spears in our stock, and we set our minimum to five. We will not buy spears because our minimum, the desired surplus is actually, this number is lower than this one. If this number is lower than this one, then obviously you, you start buying it. So that's what we want to do. We're going to do that. Same thing for the large shields. We're going to import. Now we only lost one person, so we don't need to buy a lot of these things. Let's just buy five at a time. And then as our soldiers can use them, they will start to slowly filter those into their army and our numbers will increase. And then or every time the trader comes by, they're going to look and see how many items we have relative to how many we want. And if there's, a, if there's a spread, then they'll sell it to us. So no big deal. We're good there. Now, the last thing, as bandits appear, we're just going to do the same thing. We're going to send our army out to take them out and then come back. Moving forward, though, you do have to be a little cautious. The AI will send mercenaries to go attack them. They will not attack you, but they will try and take out the bandits before you get to them. The other ones did not. It was too early in the game for them to attack but at this point if any bandits spawn they will get attacked by the ai we want to get there first because obviously we get uh we get to take all the money once we take them out the other thing that we get is this thing called influence and we haven't talked about influence yet because we can't even use it but i feel like it's a good time so you use influence to press your claims that's literally the only thing you use it for if you zoom out again or you press m to go to your map you'll notice that we own this territory in red the baron owns the yellow ones and all these grayed out ones are unclaimed. So if we want to claim the territory, we have to use a thousand influence to do so. Obviously, we don't have it yet, so we can't do it. But at some point, we will get influence. Up to this point, we've only got an influence from killing bandits. So we killed two groups of bandits. We got 640 from, from them in total. So was that 320? It's quite a lot, actually. You can get influence from a couple other ways, which we're going to do all three ways, actually. Yeah, in this playthrough, we'll do all three. So you can build some some buildings, upgrade. Like if we upgrade our church right now, it would give us 250. If we build one of our late game buildings, which is called a manor house, that'll give you some influence as well. Uh, we'll get there soon, but not quite yet. But just be aware, you need a thousand to do that. And then if you want to take land from the Duke, it's going to cost 2000. So it's double the price. But yeah, you want to claim land so you can start expanding and building multiple towns. But that's basically what that's for. We'll get there very soon. But for now, that pretty much secures our border. That is going to do it for that section. Let's move on to the next section. So this is basically where the training wheels get taken off. This is a little bit more complicated than what we've done up to this point. But we'll cover just enough so that you, you have an idea of what's actually going on. But not inundate you with too much info. So our first order of business is we need to increase our food production. And we need to produce high tier clothing. Because if you, if you look at the next goal is to become a medium town. Right now we're a medium village. That means we need to become a large village and then a small town and then a medium town. So we have three upgrades we need to do in this next section. Like I said, it's a pretty hefty one, but it'll go quick. The first thing we need to do is upgrade our burgage plots so that we have five level twos. Right now we have only two, so we should only need a little bit of timber. We can do that right away. So three more, that's one, two, and three. We'll let those finish and then 
we'll come back and, and handle the rest. Actually, you know, while that's building, why don't we work on a couple things? We need a few new burgage plots because, again, we don't want to run into that limit. Right now, we have 12 people. We're building two more. Yeah, these two are not quite done yet. So we'll have houses or a space for people to move in. But we want to have a little bit more than that. And we also want to get some extra production going. So what I'm going to do is let's build one right here, right on this wall. I'm going to make this one extra long. And I'll show you why. So we're going to make this extra long. You notice the housing size is a decent size. And then the workshop size is pretty big. We want to have the workshop size to be three to four times the size of what the house is. Usually closer to three is, is probably fine. Now we want to also have this be a double plot. So I'm going to reduce the plot division. This will give us one house plus the option to add a second house. And then this back spot is actually going to be a vegetable garden. I mentioned before, this is the only one that you want to have as big as well, not as big as possible, but you want to have it pretty big. Like I said, three to four times the size of the housing plot needs to be the vegetable garden. And that should give you a pretty good yield to your vegetables. That's going to give us another source of food. Because if you look right here, these guys need to have three sources of food. And right now we have it, but soon we're going to run out, run out of the, the, the bread. Actually, we only have two sources right now. So whatever's in the marketplace is what we have. Yeah, we have some bread left over. That bread's not going to last though. They will eat that up pretty quick, and then we're going to be stuck with only two types. These guys will start getting pissed off. Our approval will go down, and you know people stop moving in. It's it's just not a good situation. So we want to stay ahead of the curve, and we want to get another another type of food being produced. So let's go ahead and speed this up. Uh, and you can see, I, I wasn't even paying attention, but somebody dropped off another shipment of spears and shields. You can see they automatically take the, the weapons to their house. When we need to muster them all together, they just pop out of their house with the shields. So they, like I said, you don't need to have anybody in the trading post to buy items. You do need somebody in the trading post to sell items most of the time. You need somebody in there to basically bring the stuff to the trading post. And once it's there, you can get rid of them. But yeah, like I said, you don't need anybody here right now because we're just trying to buy a few things. And then as they come in, they just filter into our troops. So we leave that alone. Oh, I'm going to pause it. So we got a bandit camp sighting. So as I mentioned before, this is probably going to be contested by the AI. Now, this one spawns right in the middle, which is good for us because we can get there before the AI does. It takes them a couple seconds to respond and then they'll come in. We can we can immediately react to it. So let's go ahead and send our guys. It is a little bit of a pain because now we just lost our workforce. But I think it's worth it because they do give quite a bit of money. And, you know, we only have 431. We spent about 200 of it trying to buy supplies. And we're going to need to buy more. So we will need a little bit of cash on hand. Now, we did get a message. This one says that the raiders are near. So we are going to get raided pretty soon. We're going to track their movement, which is going to give us an extra 365 days. I don't know if this one does anything, to be honest. I always do this one, but maybe this one spawns them right away. I I'm really not sure. Just track their movement. We'll let it wait another year. Another ruler's army was sighted. You can see them. They popped up right over here in their territory. And they're going to slowly make their way down here. But they'll be too late. Here we go. So again, we're going to slow down. We have a lot more than they do this time, so this should be a pretty easy one. And we're going to have our guys push forward this time. We have a big numbers advantage, and I think we should take advantage of it. So we'll push forward. That'll give us more option to get on their flank and, and just deal a lot of damage. And you can see already they're losing people. So let's speed this up. Yeah, we didn't lose anybody. That's good news. And there's nothing else for us to do. There's no other bandit camps on the map. We don't have to fight the, the, the other barons, so we'll just sprint. We'll use up all our stamina to get back. We gotta get back to our people soon. Send the money to the town. One thing I did notice last time, and I, I don't know how I didn't notice this before, but if you disband your units on the edge of the, the map, they're gonna follow the road and walk around at a, at a walking pace. It probably makes sense to take them directly to the middle of your town and then disband them. Because there's not only are they sprinting, but they're going they're cutting across the map, which just should be a lot faster. So you can do that, you just get a little bit more efficiency. Let's just ban them right here. And you can see they go right immediately back to their job. So that's good. Now I do recommend for these burgage plots, these big ones, remember how I mentioned before that you can fit two families in this one? You can do a second living space right here by clicking on this. That'll allow two families to move in here when, when they're ready. It doesn't affect how much space is in the vegetable garden. So let's do the vegetable garden first. So if anybody lives there, they can start working on it. And the, let's expand the house to another family. So it'll give us two more there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put another house here. This is a little unorthodox, but I'm going to do it anyways. Let's do a big one. 
and we're going to put it in the back here. Now, they are really close to the marketplace, so it's actually probably not a bad idea. We could always put a road over here if we really wanted to. And again, we want to put a vegetable garden and then upgrade the living space. So that, that's going to give us four more living space. It's going to give us a ton of vegetables. This is actually enough to supply a town probably twice the size. So you could probably get away with just doing one. If you're having issues with, with timber, just do one. But I, I like to do two because I don't want to think about it later. I just want to have the food ready to go before I need it. It's just kind of how my personality is. What else do we need to do here? We need to upgrade chicken coops. We need five chicken coops. You probably don't need five, but I think five is a pretty good number. It's usually enough, depending on how much food you have from other sources, five chicken coops should be able to handle maybe 20 houses or so. You should be able to feed that many. So let's go ahead and do that. So again, we're going to click on the burgers plot, the expansion, and then we're going to go to the chicken. And that gives us five. Now we need three goat sheds. The goat sheds basically give you, if you look right here, it gives you hides. And these all cost 25 gold. The vegetable garden is only 15. That's because you have to actively till the land. These two are pet both passive. The chicken coop and the goat shed spit resources out, whether you have somebody working there or not. So it's it's 100% passive. That's that's why this one's a little bit more expensive. But we want the veggie garden because it's a different food source. So not only are we going to have eggs, but we're going to have veggies. So that's two new food sources. We got meat, berries, veggies, and eggs. So it'll be four. Now for the goat sheds, again, we need we need three of them. So let's go ahead and do that. Three. And then we'll leave these others open because we are going to need some other things. We're going to need uh, a cobbler soon. We're going to need a brewer. We got a few things that we need to do. Actually, you know, we could do the we could do the cobbler right now. Why don't we do that? So the level one burgage plot is limited to anything on this left side. If you want to get any of these artisan shops, you have to have a burgage plot level two or level three. So if we click on our level two, you see the options we have. We got a bakery, blacksmith, brewer. There's a bunch of stuff in here. We are interested right now in the cobbler's workshop because that's going to turn leather into shoes. So let's go ahead and do that. There we go. We're all set. So any of these artisan workshops, that's the level two workshops or higher. These all take that family out of the work pool. You will always have one person doing the whatever the skilled labor is. So in this case, the cobbler work, they're going to be making shoes. And then the other two family members are going to be running around carrying supplies either to or from the workshop. So these people are accounted for. We can't touch them anymore. And let's watch it for just a second. We can see what it's doing. So if we click on, again, the general tab, and then you can see if somebody walks in, maybe they'll come in with some leather. Yep, there they go. So they just brought two pieces of leather. You can see over time it'll disappear and then we'll see shoes pop up. So it happens automatically. Yep, there it goes. It flashed for a second. There it goes. There's some shoes. So we're making plenty of shoes and we're going to need that for these burgage plot level two because as you can see, these people need shoes. It does satisfy that level two need. So we're good there. The next thing that we have to take care of, uh, let's, let's do a quick recap because there's a lot of info here that we just covered. We got two new sources of food, right? We got We got eggs coming from the chickens. We've got veggies coming from the vegetable garden. That's going to take a little time, but once it gets going, then we'll be getting another source of fruit from there. We upgraded some goat sheds so that we can make more leather. And that leather in turn is getting turned into shoes now. The other thing we need to do is we need to produce ale so we can supply the tavern. You can see these people need ale to upgrade to the next level. They also need to upgrade the church, but one thing at a time, let's worry about our ale. The usual way that you would want to do this is you would go to your farming tab and you would make a farm and you would have people plant harvest and do all that stuff it's a lot of work to be honest and we have terrible land for it if you look right here the land is not fertile at all for this it's okay for ember we could get wheat from here if we really wanted to or we can get rye rye is pretty good here but if you look at the barley and flax it's terrible there's like no good land here and you know it's terrible based on the how many minus signs it has. So this is really bad. It's a three minuses. This is two. This is only one. If we go back to our emmer, actually, let's go to the rye because this one you can see all of them. This one's two minuses, one. And then you have one plus, two plus, three plus. Obviously, the more pluses you have, the more fertile the land is, which means that you get more resources. So like, let's say if I made a circle here in the green and I made a circle here in the red if, and I made those circles the exact same size, the green would produce, I'm just going to throw an arbitrary number out there. It would produce around 100. And the red for the exact same size would produce around 50, somewhere around there, 40 to 50. 
So it's it's a pretty big difference. You want to always make sure you're doing any farming on good territory. We can't do that because our land sucks. Yeah, the barley is just not going to happen here. We, we would use a lot of labor to pull it and it wouldn't give us a whole lot of benefit. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to go to our trade route. First thing we need to do is turn on our trade for a couple things. We have some tools here. So tools are just currently not active for anything. It's just a trade item. So we can sell it to make money, but they don't actually help us. It's only going to cost us 25 and we can sell 60 gold worth of things. So that's a no brainer. And we're going to export and we want to make sure the right number goes to zero so we can actually sell it. So import goes the opposite of export, right? We want the small number here and the big number here and then vice versa for export. So basically they'll send a cart here to come pick that up. We'll make a little bit of gold there. And then we need to import ale. There's a couple ways we could do it. We can import the ale directly, but it's really expensive. Very, very expensive. The other thing is we could import some of it, the parts that you need to make ale. So you need malt, which costs four. Or we could hide, we could get barley, which is one step below. This is basically the lowest when you pull it directly from the ground itself. It turns into barley like this. So it's going to cost us only two if we do it this way. Now, the difference is we have to use some labor to convert it. So it's not like you're saving six exactly. There is an opportunity cost to the person working your your malt house or whatever it is we're going to end up doing. So just be aware of that. We do probably want to do the cheaper one, though. I feel like we have more labor than we have money at this point. So we can afford to use a little bit of labor. We're going to import and we'll set this to maybe 10. Yeah, that should be good. So they're going to drop off 10 units each time. We can turn that into barley. Yeah, we do that through a malt house, which is on the industry tab. And it's the one right in the middle. So there's a couple rules of thought here. We could put it right here, right next to the trade house. The reason I don't like that particularly is because usually the warehouse grabs it before anybody else does. So... We could put it right here directly next to it. Let's just do that. Let's put it right here. And then once that's done and we start actually producing beer, we're going to need some more. We're going to need something else. So we're going to need a tavern. So under the residential tab, we can do a tavern. Now, this is important to put locally because they will actually walk to it and, and try to go to, you know, to the tavern to get a beer. So let's put it right here. This is kind of centrally located for everybody. I feel like that would be a good spot. It could also have gone up here. It could go maybe in the back or the sides. That would have been okay. What you don't want to do is you don't want to put it out here. You don't want to put it, you know, kind of far away because then people will have to walk. Every every second that they're walking means they're not working. So, I mean, it kind of sounds like I'm a slave driver, but, you know, from a business perspective, that's how it works. You don't want people walking. You want to minimize their walk so that they're putting the most amount of work in. So we're still getting families moving in. We got, I think, room for... Three more, maybe two more, because one of the, I think one of these is taken out of the, the pool. The other thing that I forgot to do is we want to start selling some items here. So let's open up our trade because we are starting to run low on money and we are starting to stockpile some goods that are worth quite a bit. We have a lot of leather, but it's not making it to the cobbler for some reason. Yeah, it's not from lack of trying. You know what it is? They're probably filling up the stalls first. Yeah, 10. That's fine. We'll let them fill it up and then we're going to go to the trade tab. Let's go ahead and activate that. So down to the shoes, we'll establish that, and then we are going to export. We want to have a little bit of a minimum, maybe like 10 to 15, because we have, let's go 15. Shoes don't get used up as much as food from the market stalls, so you, you don't need quite as much of it to last. And then the other thing is we need to hire somebody to deal with the trade post. Let's actually put two people, because we have a few things that are going to go out. We got to get rid of those tools, and then at some point we'll start selling off the shoes. We got another bandit camp show up, so we'll take care of them. They are other edge of the map. We've got an advantage ahead of the AI. They won't be able to get there in time. And we've got 36 troops now. So we should have no problem cleaning that up. Now we are starting to get barley. So I'm going to stock the malt house with a worker. And also the tavern. So they're going to grab, malt house is going to grab everything from the large warehouse. They'll end up making malt. The malt will need to go to somebody called a brewer. And we're looking for Burgage Plot 2. Any of these would be fine, but this guy's closest. And we need to turn him into a brewer. But we'll get that going in a second. Let's deal with uh, let's deal with these bandits first. There you go. They're dealt with. That was a pretty easy battle. And like I said, we'll take the money. We need to send it back to our base. Since we're going to be doing beer production, it is going to cost us a little bit of money. But we should have enough with the shoes. The shoes should cover pretty much everything we're doing. We've got a lot of... Where are you? We've got a lot of leather. 
and that gives us another 138. So we should be in good shape. There you go, they're back in the middle of the town, so we're gonna disband and they're gonna immediately get to work. Now I moved some people off of our logging camp and back onto our foraging hut because these things will go out of season soon and we wanna stock up on berries a little bit since our population is kind of growing. So we need to be able to turn the malt that we're making. So we've got 14 malt. We need to be able to turn that into beer. So let's go ahead and upgrade one of our Burgage Plot level twos. That will take somebody out of the population or workforce population. But now we can start making beer. We will staff or we will stock our tavern. And then that means these people are going to be a lot happier now. We just need to worry about the church level next. So let's wait and see if this thing starts making it. Yep, so they're getting malt and they should be producing ale. There's currently a bug right now where the granary ends up pulling all the ale out of your tavern. So like right now, the people that work at the tavern, they actually go down the street, they grab the ale and they, they roll it into the tavern. So they slowly stock it up and stock it up. And then what ends up happening is these granary workers end up taking it out and putting it back in the warehouse. They're not supposed to. The best way that I found to avoid that, so we click on our granary right here, go to the advanced tab, and there's a bunch of stuff that you can do. We don't need to worry about any of this other than turning off ale. So we do not want ale to end up in our granary. And the reason being is we want the ale to stay in the tavern so that these guys aren't... They're basically doing the exact opposite thing. So this person stocks it, this person unstocks it, and then they just go back and forth. It's a huge waste of time. So just for now, like I said, it's probably a bug and it'll probably get fixed. But for now, just disable ale at the granary and you should be just fine. So we'll do that. Yeah, this guy's got a lot of malt. So assuming this guy's making a ton of beer, we should be in good shape. Yeah, we, we're in very good shape. Now let's look at our the needs of our people. The tavern supply is being satisfied now. Really nice. So these people are just about ready to upgrade. Let's worry about upgrading our church next, and then we should be on to the next step. Now one thing I'm going to do before we finish, just because I, I doubt this is going to happen, but if we ever get to the point where we get flooded with ale and it starts causing our inventory to back up, we want to set a trade route for it so that we don't go over. So I'm going to go to the trade. We will purchase the ale trade route. We're going to export it and we'll set ourselves a minimum of, let's say, 20 or so. I mean, it doesn't really matter. We probably won't hit it, but it's, it's always a good practice to start. So if you have cheap trade routes, it's a good practice to set up extra trade routes that you don't need and just have it uh, so that it keeps your stocks at a reasonable level. Because sometimes, especially if you start building multiple towns, let's say you have three towns, you probably won't be looking at your main town that often. And so it could very well be the case where an item just completely overtakes your storage. Like right now we have 25 storage. Just imagine if we had 2000 firewood, we wouldn't really have room for a whole lot else. So what you could do is you could set up a trade for firewood to, to cap you out at say 1500. So then they'll start selling stuff past that point, And then you won't have a completely flooded storage space. Because if this thing floods, there's no room for shoes, there's no room for leather, and then your economy stalls at that point, basically. So you got to be careful of that. Again, not something you probably have to worry about in the beginning, but if you start playing for, you know, 10, 20 years, like right now we're in year three. But if we did this up to, say, 20 or 30 years, that might be something you'd have to worry about. So up next, level two church, we're going to need to deal with a couple things. So let's look at the church upgrade. It's going to cost us some stone. And it's going to cost us some tiles. So for the stone, we need to get a stone cutter camp. And the stone's right there. It's actually not too far. Let's just put it near our storage. Because we already know that the storehouse is going to end up taking all that. So that'll be good. And then we need to also worry about our clay deposits. So let's go ahead and get a clay deposit. So under... And sorry, these are both under the mining tab. So stone cutter camp is under mining. And then same thing with the mining pit. Now this you just throw right on top. You can fit multiple if you want to drain it a lot faster. Like you can fit up to four on one vein. We don't need that here. We're just going to drop one down. We'll have somebody go build those two. And what I'm probably going to do is back off one person of the forager hut. Just so we can get an extra person working. It looks like our veggies are coming in nicely. So that should stock up a fourth set of food. Which we're going to need soon. We are going to need multiple sources of food. Our stonecutter camp is set. Let's go ahead and put somebody in there to work. We need to get up to 25 stone total. The mining pit for clay is done, but let's just go ahead and fully staff whatever we have on the stonecutter camp. We'll get our full 25 stone and then we'll stop and then we'll focus on the other thing. 
And what I'm going to do to speed this up a little, let's go ahead and go around. We can micromanage just a little bit. Oh, I forgot. We left somebody. I think I had mentioned this before. I left somebody on the saw pit and they made 175 planks. We clearly don't need that much. So that was a mistake on my part. <laughs> yeah, generally you want to you want to have a, a reserve of planks and then don't have somebody on that because he will just burn through your wood supply. Luckily, we still have 20 timber, so it's not a big deal. So I'm going to pull the person off of the saw pit and I'm going to pull the person off the logging camp. And let's just put everybody on stone. Let's just max that out. And then we'll get the roof tiles going next. So the, the stone works a little different from the, the mines. You would think the mine might be on the stone. But basically all you have to do is put it anywhere on the map. And they will manually run to go pick it up. It's just sitting there on the floor. So it's not like a, a mountain that they're chiseling it out of. So you can see right here. They just go pick it up and bring it back. So with the stone, this is one of those resources that is depletable. And you cannot get it infinitely. So for this, I just put... The stone cutter camp kind of near the large warehouse or the storehouse if it was something that was a bit more permanent like for example this clay pit we could eventually make it into an infinite source you'd probably want to put the production and the storage right near it but for something like this it's a one-time use not a big deal enough stone now let's pull everybody off of stone and we're going to need to put a bunch of people on clay so let's put ev not everybody on clay we'll put all but one and then we're going to go to our industry tab again and then on the clay furnace, it's the third one over. We're going to put a clay furnace right here so we can make some clay tiles. All right, and let's check and see how we're doing. So our tavern is stocked with six. That's fine for now, but I'm, I'm a little curious why it's not getting a whole lot higher. So there's 24 malt in here. It looks like we could probably do with another brewer. I think maybe this guy can't keep up with the production that we have. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. That's one thing that... Well, actually, no, he just got a bunch of ale. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's one of the fun things about this game is kind of tweaking and seeing what your supply limit because you you can't tell just by looking at it immediately. You kind of have to go back through your supply chain and see where the bottleneck is. So if if you wanted to produce a little bit more ale, we have malt to support that. So we could turn one more person, one of the burgage plots into a brewery. I'm going to leave it for now because it seems like we have enough supply to at least satisfy the people. And then at some point we could expand that more and turn that into a profit center for us. But for now, we'll just leave it. Now we do have our clay furnace up. Let's go ahead and get that running. And we're starting to get clay. We only need 24 clay. So actually, I'm going to pull everybody off of this. So we got all the clay we need for now. And then we'll stack the clay furnace. Now, certain buildings on the production side will require you to fuel your... They basically have to fuel the fire to burn the, the clays to, to uh, cure them. So what I usually recommend doing is setting some kind of fuel reserve. You don't need much. I usually do between two and five. And all this does is keeps it stocked so that whoever's doing the crafting, remember before only one, one family or one family member does crafting and everybody else does transport. Actually for this whole building, yeah. So basically one person is going to do crafting, the other people are going to grab stuff. You want to minimize how many trips they have to take to get firewood and how much downtime the kiln is. You want to have it run at all times. So we're just going to wait till we get 24 tiles and then we're good to go. Now we did hit 36 men in our in our uh, our little town, so we can feel just about there's we're missing something. It might be we might be missing a piece of equipment. We got 35 out of 36, but pretty much we have a full regiment now of spear militia. That's really good. So we'll have no problem. Here we go, 25 roof tiles. I think we only needed 24. We're gonna turn that off and let's go ahead and upgrade the church. And then from there we can start upgrading some of these buildings. Now I'm gonna leave one person in the clay furnace because we will eventually need more tiles if we want to convert these burgage plots so you can see if you want to go from a burgage plot level two to a burgage plot level three which we will need soon it's going to cost us four tile each so it's pretty pricey and you have to pay 25 gold so pretty expensive oh, we got a bandit camp let's pause and zoom out real quick where are you bandit camp it is right next to them so this one we might need to let go Let's just see if the AI is going to spawn some people in. The last thing we want to do is take our workforce away to deal with something that the AI is going to get. They're going to beat us to it anyways. Oh, they already stole something. They just spawned in and they stole something. Yeah, see, the AI just spawned in an army. We could probably beat them to it. I'm going to let this one go this time because I just want to get some stuff going in our in our town. You'd probably want to compete for that. We have enough influence. We have a pretty good amount of regional wealth, so I'm not too worried about it. Let's just keep going. So our, our small stone church is done being built. 
That's going to do actually two things for us. It's going to increase the church level that we get for approval rating. So approval is going to go higher. Before we were getting a plus 13 at the max. That's going to go even higher. So that'll help people, you know, immigrate in even faster. And more importantly, it allows us to upgrade to level three burgage plots. Now you have to be careful with which ones you choose to upgrade. When you upgrade your burgage plot to level two, you actually fit two families for every plot. Doesn't matter how big it is. If you can get to burgage plot three, they will fit two families. So that means if we if we convert the cobbler shop, that means they're going to have two people converting shoes rather than just one. We have enough leather to probably support it, but maybe not. And then you can see our malt is actually going down. I think we we're at 24 stock before. Now we're at 17. So we would have to import more malt to be able to support a level three brewery. Yeah, we would have to probably import a few more malt. I think we're okay the way it is. I don't think we need to do that. If you want to start making more money, I guess you can go that route. Let's just upgrade something else. One thing I love to do is upgrade these burgage plots that have the veggie farms to two. These can be the, the level four or sorry, the level three burgage plots. So I'm going to upgrade these. They need to go to level two first, which we actually need level two. We need two more level twos anyways. So if you see the burgage plot to get to from large village to small town, we need to have seven level two or higher and then three level three or higher. These two will be level three and then we need one more to convert over as well. So why don't we just do the cobbler shop? I, I don't mind doing that because like I said, we do have leather and we are selling the excess shoes. So that'll just give us a little bit more income. We'll, we'll do that. Uh, the other thing, I don't remember if I mentioned or not, when you upgrade these burgage plots, a level two will pay you a certain passive regional wealth income every month. Every level two burgage plot pays you plus one regional wealth per month. The level three burgage plots will pay you two regional wealth per family per month. So basically uh, one burgage plot level three with one family gives you two but because there's two families that eventually move in, you actually get double that. You get four. So every Burgish plot level three will eventually pay you four regional wealth per, per month, which doesn't sound like that much. But let's say we had all 10 of these converted to level threes and they have two families in it. Right. So that would be what? 40, 40 regional wealth per month for free, basically. So not bad at all. It's actually probably close to enough for paying for itself. You know, if we had to import the ale without having to do any of that stuff. Uh, without selling anything, we could probably afford it just by what what these people are paying us. And I don't know what you call it, kind of like a tax. So let's get these level twos upgraded on the veggie farms, and then we'll quickly get it to level level three. There we go. Level two burgish plot on the veggie farm. They need to get fuel. So our fuel stalls slack in here a bit. Let's see what they're doing. Yeah, firewood stalls at 12. It needs to be up to, I think, about 18 or 19 to cover that. Oh, they got it. All right, sweet. So we can upgrade that, but we do need to get some more uh, logs. Looks like we're short on logs. And the other one is ready as well, and they already have supplies. So we're good there. We just need to upgrade. As soon as we get the timber in, we've got three people in our logging camp. So as soon as they get that done, we can upgrade both of these. And then this one's just about done. There we go. So I'm going to slow it down here for a second. So you can see if we go to the people tab, you can see it's a one out of two. And we'll watch that as soon as we get... Uh, an immigration tick you'll see another family move in so we'll just watch this until they show up there we go so we just got it it didn't even take a full month i don't think so they moved in his wife and son are going to come just in a minute there we go so the son and then the wife soon but anyways yep so we got two cobblers now like i said you have to be careful which one you choose to be your level three burgage plots because if you do it on something that's already got a shop in the backyard these artisans, you cannot use them in from the labor pool. So they basically are families that you have to feed, but you can't control what they do. They have to make shoes. That's all these guys can do. So yeah, you don't want to you don't want to shrink your your labor pool. And these are just about ready. We're going to upgrade this one and actually both of these we can. So once those two are done, we will move into the small town and that'll be this this section. There we go. That's another burgish plot level three. Now these people do require another set of food so there's nothing extra that they require above a level two if you can afford them at level two you can probably afford them at level three the only difference is they they do move in an extra family so it basically doubles the amount of ale and food and all, all this it basically doubles what you have but you don't need extra stuff other than the one more food type which is like i said that's kind of why we wanted to do the veggie garden because that should satisfy that fourth food type
There we go. So we got that Burgage plot upgraded, and that puts us at Small Town. Now, the next one, we just need to upgrade 10 total level 3 Burgage plots. So we've already got everything we need to go to the next level right away. As far as, like, equipment, we just need to get a few more. I think we need a, a little bit more tile. And then we need to figure out who we're upgrading here. So I, I think the brewery might as well do it, right? We've got malt sitting there. So let's go ahead and upgrade this guy to level 3. And then we ran out of, of roof tiles. So yeah, let's go ahead and convert some more. We got no clay and storage, so we're going to have to mine some of that. And both of these level 3 burgers plots already got families in them. You can see, actually, I forgot to mention, anytime you do the double one, you actually can fit four families. So it's, instead of doing going from one to two, this one goes from two to four. So the double wide burgers plots are pretty massive at level 3, as you can tell. We have a lot of extra families now. That's exactly what we needed to because we're kind of short on labor. So let's go ahead and put one family extra on the mining pit until we get a little bit of clay built up and then we'll switch them. Actually, that's probably enough. Let's put it on the clay furnace and then we should be able to upgrade more and more of these as time goes on. Now the, yeah, the brewery, I'm, I'm curious to see how well the brewery does with the second person in there. But either way, we need to upgrade all these people. We need to have 10 total. How many do we have level 2? We have only 7, so we need to upgrade a few more to level 2. So let's go ahead and do that. 1, 2, and 3. So that'll be our 3. And then all these level 2s need to get upgraded as well. There we go. We got another brewer in there. Hopefully they'll be able to keep up with the ale. Because we... Remember, every time we upgrade somebody to level 3, that's an extra family or 2... That's an extra 2 families that need to eat... That need to drink the ale. So we, we will... Probably need to increase our import of barley here, but we will adjust it as needed. And we'll just keep clicking up these level 2s to level 3 as we get supplies in. We're a little short on tile and a little short on timber, but we have people working in both of those. So we should be fine. Now our population is going to explode here, basically almost doubling what we had before because most of these could only fit one family, now they're fitting two. So we have to keep an eye, I haven't mentioned it in a while, but we have to keep an eye on our number of months before supplies run out. Our food is down to 15 months, which is not alarming, but it could be if we if we go too much further and we don't have something to counter it. So we'll probably have to upgrade some more of these. Maybe these new ones we can have do some egg egg production. That would be okay. The veggie garden did pretty good, but looks like everybody's eating the veggies before we can... Yeah, we can't really stock them too much. We might need another veggie garden. Now, I believe that's the last upgrade on Burgage Plot level three so we need we need these three to finish yeah let's go ahead and pull people out of the clay pit i don't think we're gonna need to upgrade too many more of these we can always put them back on there as needed but i think for now let's just get a few more people helping to build and make sure that we've got what we need i think we actually might be short one burgage plot so let's go ahead and upgrade yeah we're short one so we need to upgrade one more to, to a level three and we finally got the last big event so we are getting raided. They pop up over here. It's a group of 18. So what I'm going to do is let's let them get a little closer to us. The AI might spawn in an army to go fight them as well. That's one way to deal with it is you can just let the AI deal with it. If the positioning is good. Sometimes you get raided from really close by. Like sometimes they'll spawn right here and they'll be right on top of you. In this case, they're at the opposite end of the map. So it's not a big deal. We have time to react. Let's get all of our buildings done first and then we'll uh, we'll uh, recruit our spear militia here soon let's just make sure we get all the set we got a few few minutes before they show up now as you can see we have a lot of people unassigned now because we have all of these level three burgers plot families that are moving in and they have nothing to do so it is march which means it's growing season again we can throw some people back in the forager hut now there is a bug where sometimes you can't click on your building if that ever happens just save and reload it it'll clear it up for you so let's put four people on the forger hut. We want to get as many berries as we can during the growing season. So we'll do that right now. We still have five workers that we can play with. Let's throw another person in the logging camp. I think we're good on just about everything else. We'll just let let them be construction workers for now. And how are we looking on the, the raiders? So you can see they're, they're still coming. They basically have the same amount of troops that we have. The It's 36, but they have two different groups. We should be fine though. We're going to hold steady. Alright, Burgish Plot level 2. That's our last one that we need to upgrade to level 3. So we'll have we'll have our town fully upgraded then. And again, we're just keeping an eye. The AI did send an army here. So they sent two groups of 18. They hired the brigands. That's fine. 
And there we go. We just upgraded our last Burgage plot to level three, and that takes us to Medium Town. We have a pretty solid town here. We've got plenty of food and supplies. Our income is going up, even though we're importing. We're exporting enough to cover the, the imports, and then some. We've got a pretty good sized army. We got a one full regiment of spearmen, which we're gonna have to use here in just a second. We'll let these brigands get close. We wanna fight on our territory. I wanna show you one more thing before we finish this out. Uh, one thing, uh, if you go to your building tab, the construction tab, and all the way at the end, they have cosmetics. There's a erased shrubbery. You can get rid of all this stuff if it bothers you, because a lot of this is just cosmetic. You can't actually harvest it for anything. And I like to see what actually is here to, to be harvested for wood. So you can see some, whatever's left is a tree that's either growing or it's ready to be cut down and harvested. So we'll just go through, clean all this up. There we go. So you can see our logging camp is pretty much in the middle of nowhere. They, they have nothing to, that they can really harvest. So what I'm going to do is build another one near, maybe a little bit closer to the wooded area. And then we'll extend the road here to connect. Now the good thing about these logging camps is you, you can just leave this one. You don't have to deconstruct it. And if you put workers, they will fill up any of these storage. And then once it's full, they will just start pushing it to the other, other logging camp, even if they don't have anybody there. Because remember, the logs don't fit in our storage, in the storehouse. They have to go in a logging camp. So what I generally recommend doing is putting a couple logging camps around your base so that let's say if we want to build something out here and we have a logging camp here, they just pull the, the wood from here. It's really close. And if you're planning on building an extension somewhere out here, you could put a logging camp ahead of time and then they'll slowly fill it up. And then when you're ready to build, you have everything ready to go very close by. So that's that. Let's keep an eye on these raiders. Yeah, they're getting pretty close, so we'll probably want to rally our troops. Now the AI looks like they're... Yeah, unfortunately, they're going to go for the brigand camp. We're not going to be able to get it. I guess if we went earlier, we could have done it. Oh, no, no, no. They're going to take our kills. We don't want that. We can get close enough to draw them in. Yeah, see, there we go. They, they kind of go off who they're closest to. That's who they want to go after. So we'll just keep moving towards them. Make sure... No, they're moving away again. There we go. Now they want to fight. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pull them back onto our territory because I wanted to show you something. So we will actually fight them on our, our territory. So let's set up our line, make sure we're solid. Again, we don't want to be moving. And the other thing is if you're on a hill, you do get a slight advantage. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to position. It's kind of hard to see. If you zoom all the way down to the, or the flat part, you can see there's a slight hill right here. So we could go right there. The other way is if you go to the build it construction tab and just take any, literally take any building. I usually like to do like one of these buildable plots because they don't get in your way. It, it pulls up these contour lines. So these contour lines tell you what the slope is. So if you come down here, you can kind of see it sloping up and then you, you zoom out, you can see the actual contour lines do follow the slope. So there's a slope right here. There's also another one back here in the wooded area. So if we wanted to, we can pull them to the woods or more likely what we should probably do is just pull them right here. And that'll give us a slight advantage on the hill. All right, now for some reason they're wanting to skew a little bit to this side. So let's reposition and make sure that we can meet them head on. Oh no. It's more important to be stable so you can get it that impale than it is to be perfectly in line with their attack. It's fine, we'll deal with it. Now what I wanted to show you is if you look at right here, you get a pretty big advantage to your morale by being in your home region. It's plus 90. It's a significant boost if you're fighting a close battle. If the battle's not even close, then you, you don't need it because you're just going to stomp through their their manpower quickly anyways and you won't have to deal with morale issues but in this case they they have equal numbers and they're pretty tough so we do want to do this in our home region so we can get the, the balance of power so let's see if we're actually getting anything for yeah see you can see right here we have the high ground on our effectiveness we're getting plus 40 percent for that it's a very big difference so you always want to be fighting on the hill if you can possibly so plus 40 is is massive for us so this is going to be a tough battle. Let's actually get in here. Let's see what's going on. Yeah, they're just beating each other senseless. And hopefully our guys are stabbing them in the throat. Yeah, you can definitely tell the, the little hill is, is a pretty big advantage. Now, one thing you do have to be aware of, if they're pushing you back, you might have to push them back because right now we have the hill advantage. But that may not always be the case. So right now we still have high ground if we need to. We can actually force our guys to push forward and that'll force them back a little bit. 
or if they're falling back and you get off of your hill, you can just disengage. So there's ways to pull people off of their line that they're at. You could fall back. So like, let's say if we were in their position, we would either want to push forward to get them on the flat ground or lure them in by following back by falling back to the flat ground here. So pushing forward is this button. Fall gr give ground is this button. There's also other stances that you can use, like, for instance, missile alert. This gives you a better chance to block the enemy missiles, but your melee defense is, is halved. So you generally want to be in this if, if you're taking volleys, but if you know you're going to be close, if you're close to being into melee combat, you don't want to be that in that uh, formation. There's also stand your ground where you get double the defense, but half of the offense essentially is what happens there. So this is really good if you have like, let's say if we had a massive army and the enemy's loading up on one side, but we wanted to overwhelm one of their flanks and try and collapse. You could have whatever unit you're using to block the rest of the units. You want them to hold out as long as possible. You don't really care how many kills they get. You just need them to survive as long as possible. That's when stand your ground is really, really good because their defense is going to be doubled. They're going to have a lot, a lot higher chance of surviving longer. So anyways, that's, that's mostly, there's a few other commands that you can do. They're on the mercenary units and we haven't touched them yet. So we're going to skip it for now, but just be aware mercenary units are not the same as your militia units they can form a shield wall and some other things but yeah just be aware of that let's let this battle speed up and get it done with so we're taking some losses but we're really doing a good job here yeah look at that we locked we only lost three people and it looks like the ai is going to leave this bandit camp alone they're, they're not wanting to do anything with it so let's go ahead and they took out the units that were guarding it but they they don't care about the bandit camp itself so let's go take it that'll give us some free money so as I mentioned in the very beginning, dealing with bandits and brigands, it's really not that big of a deal. So if you're if you're watching this before you're playing the game, just realize that you can deal with anything that comes your way very easily. The only time you're going to have trouble is if you guys try and attack the Baron. You do need a much bigger army to do that, but you can do it at your own pace. You don't you're not forced into fighting him at any point. You can just sit back, build up your base. You have to fight a, ba a, a band of bandits once in a while, but you know everything I've showed you up to this point, this group of 36 is more than enough to handle all of that. So not really that big of a deal. Don't be afraid of this. If, if, you're, if you want to do the combat, but you're kind of scared because you think you're going to get overwhelmed, just follow this guy. You'll be perfectly fine. Trust me. Let's come back here. And we did get a little bit of wealth from that 131. Not that we need it. We're already rolling in the dough now. So there's one thing I wanted to, to talk to you all as well. When you fight in your home region, you have to worry about dealing with the dead bodies so let's go ahead and disband these people let them go back into the labor force the church is used to bury people essentially so you can see right here we, as soon as we assign people they start collecting bodies so they're going to go grab people and have them buried yep they're going to go do a good job they're going to go clear the battlefield you can see right here they're picking up bodies I wonder who's floating away today. Stop now this is super important if you don't deal with this it will cause a massive dip in your approval. You can see right now approval is only minus two. If we were to let this go on for another like two or three months, it could dip your approval to basically to zero. And then if you go to zero approval, everybody moves out and then you have no town. Like you will lose the game by doing that. So be very careful when you're fighting in your own territory. So just make sure you have a church ready to go. You can also do a burial pit. So if you go to your construction tab on the residential, all the way at the very end, there's a corpse pit. Generally, you want to put the enemy in the corpse pit and your friends, your allies that fell in battle. We have three people that three civilians that died in battle. We want to put them in the church because they get a proper Christian burial. Whatever that means. You can see they're transporting the bodies. They're going to put them in the cemetery here. There you go. They're building little cemeteries for them or little uh, crosses for them. And you can see right here storage. There's dead bodies in there. So let's see if they can handle it all. It looks like they do they actually do bury the enemy dead bodies in the church so you can just have a church and take care of all the bodies it's not that big of a deal or what would be more efficient is i would probably build a corpse pit right here because they're 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 really cheap to build they're free basically and then they could just bury it right there actually why don't we do that that'll speed that up quite a bit oh well, there's only four bodies left but anyways there you go corpse pit is done the nice thing about the corpse pit is you don't have to occupy it you could just have somebody work at the church and they will use the corpse pit as a storage spot, so they will actually go load that up manually. It's kind of cool seeing them build... Yeah, it's kind of cool seeing this cemetery over here. So anyways, that's all done. Bodies are done. We got rid of the debuff already as well, so we'll cut the church workers loose. We don't need to bury anybody else.
So that pretty much wraps up that section. We're going to move on to the last section now. Now, in the last section, let's talk about preparing for the end game. Essentially, at this point, you have a very well built uh, town. We're almost at 100 population. So we've got plenty of people that we could use for both military. If we want to build out a trade empire, there's a lot of things that you can do. What I would probably recommend doing here is at least get one more militia group ready. We already have spears, so we can go that route. But if you want to start making other units, you could do, let's say, like archers. Those are pretty good. If you have a strong front line, you can get some archers to back them up. You would just need to get some longbows for them, which you can either make right here, the bowry, the bowyer's workshop, or you can import them just like we were doing the other ones. Either way would be fine. In this case, we already have spears. I'm just going to increase the amount of spears that are dropped off. So let's put, take both of these up to 36 so we can get a full stack and then start another group. So I'm going to increase this up to 20 just so we don't blow through all of our cash. And that should be enough. We'll start another group right here. And what it ends up doing is it splits them in half and then it'll fill them up slowly as you get more equipment and more people. The other thing that we could do is give them a helmet that would actually increase their armor and allow them to survive a bit longer in combat. So let's go ahead and open up a trade route for helmets. We're going to establish that. We're going to import. I'm going to set this to 20 as well. Now, what ends up happening is they will grab as 20 comes in, the existing troops will grab it, put it in their house and they'll store it and it'll take it out of the supply. And then the next group of 20 comes in, whatever soldier didn't get it the first time, they'll grab it. And then another 20 comes in and then it basically keeps going until everybody has helmets and then you'll fill up another 20. So you basically have 20 in reserve. So it's always good to have some kind of stash in reserve. Don't go too crazy because you don't want to blow through all your cash. The other thing we're going to need is more troops. So right now we have, it says 60 men. We're only able to field about 40 of them for some reason. So what we probably need to do is increase our burgage plots. So we can just throw a bunch of these down. If we want to upgrade these eventually, we want to make sure that they have access to the market stalls. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll put them somewhat close by and we can make these so that they have the extension in the back. There we go. There's another seven houses. And it's got a nice little curve to it. So that should be enough for that. Let's work on the other thing. As far as securing your borders, you could do it even further if you were to build a manor house. Now we need more stone for that. So let's go ahead and put some workers on the stone, which we have right here, stone cutter camp. So let's put four people on that. We only need 15 stone. So let's gather that. We only need, actually, we only need four more. We've got plenty of stone. Let's go ahead and build our manor house. Now the manor house is under the administration tab. You can only build one per, per town. It does give you 250 influence and it increases your administration. So you see right now, our lack of administration building is actually causing us some kind of public disorder. If you get public disorder too low, you could have people turn to banditry and then you're, you're basically your peasants run off and they become bandits and you have to fight them and they'll steal stuff. Not the end of the world, but it is kind of annoying. So what I'm going to do is build a manor house. You can put it anywhere you want. It doesn't really matter where you put it, to be honest. I'm just going to throw it down here. Actually, no, let's let's put it somewhere that looks a little bit nicer. Maybe, maybe up here by the church. How about that? Yeah, so we'll commit to doing that. Another thing that you might want to do, we have only two ox right now. Two oxen. We could upgrade the small stables, and that'll allow us to fit more. Or you could just simply build more of these hitching posts. You can put them all over the place and just buy a, a few more ox. And then they'll be all over the place ready to go. So, you know, like I said, you need them to build buildings and you need them for the logging camp to work. So it's always good to have more than you need. Really, the bottle, the only bottleneck there is how much wealth you have. We have a lot of money, so I probably should have done it sooner. But like I said, I'm, I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible. But when you're starting to move into the late game, I would highly recommend getting a bunch of ox. You can't really have too many. You know, if you don't end up using them, they just sit there and you waste 20 gold. Who cares? It's good to have it ready to go, though. There we go. Our manor house is done. So this is going to open up quite a few possibilities. You do get two families move in, but unfortunately you don't get to use them. They end up being the job title servant. So they basically just, they're not accessible. You can't, you can't use them to, to do useful stuff. So if you go over to your manor house and look on the taxes tab, you can enact an, a land tax or a tithe. The land tax is basically converting regional wealth into your personal treasury wealth. We don't need to do that right now. We've got plenty of money. Uh, we've got troops and all that stuff. The only thing we really need to do with the, the regional wealth is expand a new territory and create a new town or hire mercenaries. But like I said, we've got we've got this pretty much locked up. We got almost two full regiments of spears. 
And then the other thing that the manor house gives you is these retinue troops. These guys are very strong. And if you click on the retinue troop, you can go to customization right here. You can recruit more. They cost 50 of your personal treasure, not regional wealth, but your personal treasury. So you can spend 50 gold to do that. And then you could also upgrade them for only eight gold. We have the perk that reduces the import cost. So normally this would cost 18, but because we have that perk, it only costs eight. So it's actually really good. So at some point you'd probably want to enable tax, but right now we're kind of burning through our money. So, and we don't need it. So let's save our money. The other thing is tithe. This is kind of broken right now, but basically just put it on a certain amount and it's going to slowly trickle into influence. It'll turn a little bit of your food. Yeah, it basically converts a little bit of your excess food into influence. So we'll just leave that on. The other thing you can do here, once we get a bunch of money, we can upgrade our retinue troops up to 12. And if you want to go beyond that, you go to the castle planner. And then there's a few things. The, all of these pretty much don't work except for one, the garrison tower. The garrison tower does work. So if you place it, it doesn't matter where you place it. It basically increases your retinue size by 12. So instead of having... Instead of having a retinue group of 12, you can get them up to 24. It's it's huge. You really want to do that as soon as you can. And that'll that'll increase your defensive capabilities by a lot. Now, the next thing we could probably do is expand to a new region. We got to see what we're lacking. So currently, we have access to infinite clay if we get the perk for deep mind. So if you go up here in your, your tab, we haven't really looked at perks. Uh, I'm kind of leaving that to you guys to figure out how you want to use them. But I would say for this specific region, because we have infinite clay, you can build a deep mine here that will never run out. You could also do the same thing for the iron deposit if he had the rich rich deposit. This In this case, it only works here. So I would probably say we'd want to find a, a region that has good iron deposit or has good farmland. The farmland will allow us to import that barley instead of having to buy it. So if you look right here, this region has only one rich, rich deposit, which means the other rich deposit is actually the soil. So if you come down here... We haven't talked about this. If you open up the construction tab, this overlay thing pops up. You can click on emmer, which is basically your wheat, your flax, or your barley. These are the three things that you're going to be making most of the time. And if you look at our main territory, barley is terrible here. It's all red. It, these are minus signs. It tells you how bad the soil is. So three minuses basically means you're not going to get anything from it. Orange means it's a waste of your time. You really don't want to do it here. You could get away with doing emmer because there's some two two plus signs here it's not bad so you could do some if you want to make bread you could do it in the home region but anything beside that you really want to get to an area that has better soil like if we click on the barley here you can see there's three pluses in a pretty good chunk of the the map over here there's also flax in a, a pretty abundant here and then emmer is literally everywhere so almost the whole thing is covered so this would be a good area if we wanted to expand our beer production i don't see any good for iron, anything good for iron, we have to go further out. Actually, there's no good iron sources here. But we'd have to import that. The AI owns them. Yeah, they actually have two areas that are good for iron. So we'd have to take over their territory if we want to get that. But for now, why don't we just claim our neighbors, th this neighboring province, because we can, we can import our beer from there. So you go to the map or you press M, you zoom out all the way, and then you see right down here, you, you click on the region you want, and then you do claim with influence. So that's going to cost us a thousand influence. And it's going to start the timer. You can see we have tw we have 1,500 wealth. So we could technically do two, right? If we really wanted to. And uh, we'll just leave it right now. Because we want to have some influence. If you want to claim one of the AIs, you want to have 2,000 influence. So these these gray ones are neutral. Nobody owns it. So it only costs 1,000 influence. If you want to take it from the AI, you have to have 2,000 influence for that. So just save it up. Now, the other thing is we need to get our home region in order. We have 14 people that have nothing to do. So that's... Kind of a waste of labor what i'm going to suggest doing here is let's go ahead and spam some mining pit stuff same thing with the clay furnace we have plenty of people there we've got two people in the trading post that should be plenty and then what we'll end up doing is trading for tiles so roof tiles we can start another trade out for that we're going to set that up as export and let's build up a little bit of a stockpile we need four tile for every burgage plot level three we, we want to upgrade so let's just keep 10 if we want to no, actually let's keep five yeah, we'll have 20. That means we can upgrade 5 at any time without having to wait for the stockpile back up. That should be plenty. Anything above 20, we will sell off. So we'll just let that run for a little while. I'm going to turn on our regional taxes just so we can get a little bit of our personal income going. We'll need it to upgrade our retinue and all that. So we do want to turn that on. Now, just be aware when you when you enable land taxes, based on how much money is being siphoned off, it will cause some approval loss. Our approval is pretty close to 100. 
So I'm not really worried about it. Let's let some time pass. Nice, we got a region claim. So this is our neighbor's region, our neighboring region. Like I said, it doesn't have anything permanent that we can do other than the farming. So we would probably come in here and set up a farming outpost. Now, if you want to establish an actual town here, you have to come into your construction tab, go to the administration tab, and then settlers camp. You do need 250 treasury wealth, not, not regional wealth, because this region doesn't have anything yet, but it's treasury. So that's why we turned on our taxes. So we would need 250, you put it down, and it's basically the exact same thing as you starting a brand new game, right? You you start with the same level of resources. You can pay to have more if you want, but yeah, basically it would be the same thing. You start this whole guide all over again, right? Put down your warehouses first, get some wood cutting camps, all that stuff. So that's how you expand to a new territory. And you could do that for literally every province on the map if you wanted to. It's pretty fun. Now we did get enough spears and shields. We have a full complement of equipment. So if you look right here, not only do they have the spear and shield, but they also have the helmet. So they have an extra piece of armor and we have two full regiments ready to go. So there's there's no raid that's going to bother us. We are 100% good. And you can see we converted our wealth. We had 5%. We had about 400. 5% of 400 is about 20. So that's exactly what, what it was. And you can see right here on the approval rating, we have a minus four for taxation. But like I said, it's not a big deal. We're still above 75%. And we are starting to sell roof tiles, so we should see our income tick up quite a bit here. Here we go. There we go. They just sold a bunch of tile. We got a hundred and something off of that. Not bad. So our, our regional wealth is actually going up. And remember, every time our regional wealth goes up, that means we're going to be getting more taxes converted into our personal bank account. And we can use that to start another little town over here. So we got a pretty big chunk of money here. We got 361. I'm going to go ahead and start another town here. Like I said, it's the same thing as you've seen before. You set up basically where you want, and you want to put it near the food so you can see the two food sources here. It's going to be the exact same as the way that this guide started. So we'll throw that down. You can choose between a modest, average, and plentiful start. These are not currently in the game, so you only get a town. But basically, you could start with, depending on how much money you want to spend, you, it, it does cost quite a bit of money. So you, you can, you'll be just fine doing the cheapest one. It's not a big deal. That's how you started the beginning one with anyway. And like I said, you just run through the same thing. Get these two up, and then once you get your your basic necessities established, then you can figure out how you want to do it. Like, for example, in this one, you probably want to go the farming route early on. So rather than going through all that other stuff, I would probably switch into farming in this area because that's what this area is known for. So that's pretty much it. I would say at this point, your job is to figure out how you want to proceed. Do you want to create a trade empire? You can create a profit center in each one of these regions and slowly expand. I've been able to get my money up to a couple hundred thousand before doing that. It's really, really fun trying to optimize that. You could conquer the rest of the map. And in that case, you'd want to take over some regions and get a, a retinue up as fast as possible because those retinue troops are what you're going to need to take on these guys. If you take on the first group, it's not as bad. When you take a second province, he sends a very big army. So be aware of that. Pretty tough. Another fun thing that you might want to try out sometime is just getting your home region to a very high population without collapsing. You can get up to 500 or 1,000. I've seen it go up to above 2,000 even. Uh, it does slow your game down once you get up to a really high amount. So just be aware of that. But it's it's a lot of fun. So it it's really up to you how you want to proceed. But I hope this guide has been helpful. Now, I'm currently working on a guide to cover everything in the game. All the buildings, all the combat mechanics, testing, the perks. Everything's going to be covered in this guide. If you're interested in that, as soon as it's ready, you can click this video right here. If otherwise... I appreciate your time and we'll see you guys on the next video. Take care.